Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the May 9th, 2023 Portsmouth School Board meeting. Um, can we have the roll call, please? Liz Barrett? Here. Pip Clues? Here. Lisa Rappaport? Here. Ann Walker? Here. Margot Peabody? Here. Nancy Clayberg? Here. Hope Van Epps? Brian French? Here. Carrie Nolte? Danielle Miles? Here. Nick Dolan? Here. And the SAU 50 rep, what I didn't catch your name. It's Katie Curtis. Katie Curtis. Katie. Welcome, Thank you. Welcome, Katie. Katie. Welcome, Katie. Okay. All right. Can we all stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands. One nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, next <laughs> on our agenda is announcements <laughs> and recognitions. Um, yeah, that's better. Do you have something or should I? I do. Um, a, couple of, a couple of different things. One, uh, just a quick announcement uh, is uh, following up on a couple of different Parent Square messages, some Facebook posts, some, some other uh, things. Just a reminder to the general public that we're in the process of uh, doing our work around Portrait of the Graduate. Um, we, uh, as we're doing that work, uh, there's going to be an opportunity for stakeholders across the district uh, to be involved in focus groups uh, if, if you'd like to. Uh, and then in addition to that, some survey work that will be based on what we get coming out of focus groups. So there are two um, inside of schools. We have small groups of students and staff who are going through uh, that process to talk about really what do we, what do we want the future of Portsmouth schools uh, to look like. Uh, and in addition to those school-based opportunities, we'll also have a couple of opportunities for the um, uh, really more targeted towards the general public, parents, uh, community members, uh, to be to engage in that conversation as well. So t uh, tomorrow night is the first of two evenings devoted to that, uh, and that will be held at the uh, Wamasa uh, Greenleaf Recreation Center uh, on uh, the Greenleaf Ave. Uh, and there are two, I think the first session's at 4.30 and the second's at 5.30. Uh, and um, there are cons uh, folks who are coming down from the consulting group we're working with, Great, uh, Great Schools Partnership, who will be there. Um, I've been told this is gonna be, a, this will be a more informal event. Um, there is, uh, Wamset will be in the middle of doing um, a cookout for folks uh, as part of it too, and there'll be picnic table opportunities to sit around and to go through this set of questions that the, the school board actually went through this evening um, with Leah Tuckman, who's our primary uh, person. So for the general public, again, 4.30 and 5.30, the two slots uh, tomorrow night at Wamaset, uh, and then on May 15th uh, at Portsmouth High School, uh, five o'clock and six o'clock, I believe, and we'll be starting at the library. And if we need to, we'll expand out to other rooms. Um, but we really hope that people uh, come out. There will be, like I said, survey opportunities, but we're really hoping for uh, a very rich dialogue uh, with our stakeholders uh, across the community. And this is not limited to Portsmouth residents. This, this also um, is for uh, all the folks in uh, SEO 50. Uh, as sending uh, sending communities to our high school. So that's the announcement. And then I have a couple of appreciations, if that's all right. Uh, appreciations. Uh, we have not uh, met uh, since the, um, the shooting threat that we had at uh, Portsmouth High School. And, and I had put out uh, a message to folks, but I just want to reiterate some of the thank yous that I had uh, in that. Um, you know, our, our police department can't say enough good things about the, the, the strength of the partnership and the collaboration that occurs uh, with, the, with the police department uh, to be able to have such a uh, extremely effective uh, force with very capable people um, and to be brought in as when we have issues that are connected to the school, we're very much brought to the table as a, as a co-equal. Uh, in that conversation, and that's not always the way those, my experience, that's not always the way those things go. Uh, and I think it's been uh, led to a lot of success. I also wanna thank uh, the Portland Police Department in Portland, Maine. Uh, we're a big part of uh, helping bring that to a, to a successful conclusion, um, trying to find uh, the suspect. 
Uh, the FBI and federal law enforcement uh, were connected with it, Snapchat. Uh, lots of different folks in terms of that um, trying to identify the threat and then ultimately come to um, bring the person into custody as, as they go through their uh, legal process. I want to thank staff. Um, this was a really challenging uh, period of time for, uh, for staff. Uh, particularly want to thank our administrative team and our principals who over um, those couple of days, um, we had to move really fast uh, with a lot of planning, a lot of thinking, uh, and we had to really move on our feet and um, to be able to have a leadership team where we could distribute tasks and people could be given a short period of time and to be very thoughtful about what we were doing. Um, as we came in on the day where we had canceled school, uh, we had a whole bunch of tasks we gave out to people saying, look, we don't know, we still didn't have the, the, the suspect in custody, um, but we're gonna build right now around the idea that we are in school tomorrow. And what do we need to do to be able to thoughtfully re-enter um, what are our, what are all of our different uh, community stakeholders going to need? And uh, principals did an amazing job of um, of doing that work and having us well prepared. Where when we did ultimately, um, you know, have the the uh, individual in custody, that we felt we were ready to bring people back in the next day, and we thought that was appropriate as well. So I want to thank all those folks. I want to thank uh, students uh, and parents uh, <coughs> because what was great was as we talked about the re-entry day on Friday, um, one of the things we talked about at the high school because we thought people would be particularly affected at the high school because that's where the threat occurred was how many people do we think are gonna come? Uh, and, you know, and I think we kind of discussed the fact that, you know, if we got, if we got better, than, um, better than two thirds, that was gonna be a win. And if we had less than 50%, then that would, you know, be uh, less than a win. Uh, and ultimately, we, we far exceeded uh, what we were uh, looking at. We did very well for just a Friday on a, a warm Friday as you entered the spring. We did really well. Uh, and uh, and that, so it's a real tribute to, to our students and our, uh, and our parents and our families that, th that people, um, people wanted to get back up on the bike, I think is the way I described it. Uh, and, um, and that was wonderful and it was helpful and I think it allowed us to be in a position we're coming back on the next Monday. We had gone through that first, those first few tough moments, uh, and we're ready to get back into the swing of things. Um, I'll mention as I'm in the midst of that, I will also mention. Um, you know, I want to recognize uh, students today who uh, at the at the high school um, started to flex their civic muscles a little bit uh, and did a um, did a structured. Um, walk out for a period of time to express their concern about about safety in schools uh, and school violence, um, and did so in a very respectful, very respectful way. Coordinated with administration uh, to make sure that the that the work what that what they did honored the the um, the seriousness of what they were trying to speak to. Uh, and I think they did a really, they did an excellent job of doing that. They were very organized, structured, and they went out and they, they um, said their piece and then went back in. So I, kudos to those students for, um, for going through that process. Uh, and then the last, it's, it's in the midst of all that stuff, it's also Teacher, teacher Appreciation Week. Uh, and, um, you know, I, I have said to staff before, <laughs> I, I am the, you know, I'm the son of two lifelong high school educators, uh, both, you know, 30 plus years. and. I just, I, I, I so deeply, um, I so deeply, I'm so deeply grateful for the staff that we have, and all the work that people put in, all the stuff that's beyond what their their contract says, you know, their job is, um, in terms of helping form, you know, the the, um, the young citizens that are going to be the next wave of uh, Portsmouth. So uh, as we move, as we are in the midst of that week, my encouragement to, um, to the community would be, you know, then, and PTOs are doing amazing things for our staff to, to, to let them know that they're, they're thanked. And, but just like the one line email that, that just says, thank you for what you're doing for my kid, done. Um, that goes so far for staff, you know, Six months from now, when they're dealing with a challenging situation, or they're to know that um, that our community um, has their back and appreciates the work that they do is, is super important. So, if people can do that, that would be great. And that's all I got. Anyone else have an announcement? Margo, um, we haven't met since the um, 
Earth Day and Portsmouth's first day of action, I am really pleased to announce that we had over 500 participants at the Sustainability Fair, which was Friday night, the kickoff, um, and not just from Portsmouth. So I think um, it was really empowering to see the energy in the room and the ideas being shared and the students that were there. So that was <clears throat> fantastic. And then to follow that on the day of action, we had about 40 volunteers from our schools. Um, we collected over about 20 bags of trash from our elementary schools, we painted the shed at Leary Field, and then in partnership with Sabre, all of our trash was biked to the gathering as opposed to um, increasing our carbon footprint, which was really just awesome to see these carriages of bikes with <laughs> trash piled high to the two DPW trucks. <clears throat> And then we collected <coughs> over 166 pounds of trash on Pierce Island. So I would say all in all, it was a huge success and we're really thinking strongly about how to make it better next year. It has been duly noted that the timing of it being over April break was challenging for families and we, we knew that, um, but the seed has been planted and now we see where we <coughs> can grow it. So um, feel free to share ideas with me, but it was, it was awesome. It was great to be part of that community. So thank you. And Mr. Rose, a special shout out as our <laughs> faculty volunteer. Thank you. And thank you, Margo. You put your heart and soul into that and it obviously was very successful. So good thank you. Welcome. Um, yes, Liz. Um, it, it is Teacher Appreciation Week and obviously they deserve more than a week, but I just wanted to point that out and just say thank you to our teachers. Thank you. I have one announcement. I was wondering if board members would be interested in marching in the Portsmouth 400 parade on June 3rd at 11 a.m. I was thinking, we did this a few years back, we could get a big banner that says Portsmouth School Board and we could all march behind the banner in the parade. We could have our kids come. Um, our kids always came and it was so much fun. Um, we could bring balloons, have the kids hold balloons, or we can buy some balloons, I suppose. Um, but anyway, I thought we could participate in the Portsmouth 400 parade. Would people like to do that? Sure. I mean, uh, I'm already signed up to go with Van, oh, but they, uh, they don't, they're not gonna put me in a trolley now, so okay. uh, which I'm a little disappointed about, so I will, um, <laughs> I will march with the school board if that's what you wanna okay. do. <laughs> Um, I was thinking we could open it up to staff, students, anybody that wants to march with us in the Portsmouth 100 parade. But we will have this banner that says Portsmouth School Board, so we'll be identified as the. <clears throat> we did it for years in the Christmas parade, and it really is a lot of fun. So and this is huge. I mean, this is going to be huge. I think they said there are 400 people that are going to be in that Portsmouth band. Um, because it's the current band and then all the alumni that are going to be with it. It's something like 400 people. Beautiful. So it's going to be huge and fun. So, okay, I will get the banner. I'll get you all this information, tells you where to park, uh, all that kind of stuff. So I'll be sure everybody gets Should we this. get handouts, like identify some handouts, like a focus group handouts or? Uh, oh, I know we could do that. <laughs> 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 Kindergarten <laughs> registrations. <laughs> Lead testing. Yeah. Hiring, hiring for paraeducators. There you go. There yeah, you, you go. go. Yeah, okay. Drivers. Oh, okay. Bus drivers. <laughs> hiring for bus drivers. Yep. Exactly. Custodian. Good call. Okay. Lisa, you had something to say. Yes. I just want to give a shout out to the cast and crew of Mean Girls at the high school. Yes. They just did a series of amazing performances, you know, in the spirit of Teacher Appreciation Week. We had some incredible educators in our chorus and drama program for years who recently have been replaced by some new fabulous people and it's really hard to fill big shoes and they're doing a great job. So it was a good show and it's a great program. Thank you, thank you. We have a lot to be proud of. Okay, we will move on. The next item on the agenda is the acceptance of the April 11th um, regular meeting minutes. Do I'd we have like a motion to, to approve? I'd like to approve it. I'd like to make one change. Okay. At the, very, at the very end of the minutes, it mentioned the citywide neighborhood committee meeting that I attended. It actually wasn't a citywide committee. It was the Ward 4 committee. Okay. And it was held at John Darrow School. Okay. Do we have a second for the motion and the change? Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. We will move on to... A public comment session. Um, I don't believe there is anyone here for public comment. <laughs> well, Do we, no, nobody on. Nobody online. Nobody on Zoom. Okay. 
All right, we will table close. It, table it. Ta oh, table it till the end. Okay, in case someone comes in. Okay, we move on to presentation, presentations, and I think we have our distinguished Portsmouth High School principal, <laughs> <laughs> Steve Canosi. Where, where is my podium? Yes. Podium, yeah. Hello, hello. How is everyone? Good, hello. how are you? I'm good, I'm good. I wore my swag, because I remember the last time I was in front of you all, there was some, uh, sorry, I earned my keep and, and got some Clipper swag. Um, <laughs> No, I'm excited to be here and, and uh, walk us through. We have obviously a lot of great updates. You've announced a whole bunch of them. but um, And I know our time here tonight is really focused on some of the conversations that have been happening around honors, dual enrollment, advanced placement. Um, so, yeah, so I'm just going to walk us through, you know, just some real basics, some background, and then where we're headed and, and where we find ourselves now, and, and, and some data sets we were able to... Uh, initiate a survey recently with college admissions reps regarding this topic. So we have some data from some, from some of our partner colleges. So yeah, originally I just really want to kind of go back to 21 and the years 21, 22, that school year, um, where uh, Portsmouth High School announced in the program of studies and through messages out to the community um, that there would be increasing the number of dual enrollment courses offered in the catalog and for kids. Um, and so that idea was that in that catalog, 21-22, they actually ran AP and dual enrollment side by side. Um, and that was really important. It was also a really interesting experiment to see where our families were, where our kiddos were. So in that year, uh, the year before I got there, um, one, or we ran Spanish, AP and dual enrollment, modern European history, French, um, and, and a few others. And the, the requests for enrollment were what was really important. Um, so for example, in our Spanish dual enrollment or AP, we had three requests from students for AP Spanish, but we had 74 requests for dual enrollment. And that, that ratio basically was repeated um, throughout uh, French, modern European history, and that just gave us a lot of data set. It was news to me, I, you know, as I kind of did my onboarding and, and some um, due diligence it was an interesting opportunity to really understand where our kids, where our families were and those choices. And what I've said all along um, as we kind of develop courses and we, we move forward together is that we're looking to create an ecosystem of opportunity for students. That is the number one goal. We're not in the business of reducing opportunities. We're in the business of expanding opportunities. And dual enrollment uh, really represented that. And I said at one point, you know, AP is an amazing, not only an organization with the College Board, but it, it's had, you know, decades of established rigor, established experience. So this is a good thing. Um, I was an AP student. I taught AP for 10 years as an English teacher. Um, it was also the only game in town for a long time when we talked about that kind of national level or next level rigor. Um, the idea of dual enrollment is an amazing opportunity to include in our program of studies. So that's just the background as we kind of migrated ourselves to this, this idea. Um, so some of the, the things, and we can do Q&A, are we waiting for the end? I'm, I'm okay with people. Why don't we wait till the end? Okay, sure. So a couple of the things that I wanna to move to, just as, as a background. So to, to kind of name it really quick, what we found this year, which I think was really, it was a little bit of a su surprise to me and, and definitely some surprise to some of the community, um, those requests for, a, for a dual enrollment continued to increase, as did our number of offerings in dual enrollment. And that was happening all along. Um, so we found ourselves in this, the program of studies that we produced this year with literally only two APs offered. Um, AP Physics 1 and 2. That's in the current program of studies. Um, and again, when I, when we came to that conclusion, part of me thought, okay, this was something that was already in motion, right? That the dual enrollment, the choices families were making, kiddos were making. When I found out about the, the prior program of studies running the side-by-side -side, um, offerings and saying very clearly in the program of studies, um, we will run the course with the most requests. That was the kind of directive that was given out to the, to the students in the community. So 
never in my wildest dreams that I actually think that that was um, a surprise to the community to be really honest and bold. I actually didn't know that that was gonna be a surprise to some of the community that we only had two APs. Um, so again, we are not anti-AP, we're pro-opportunity. Um, I said at one point that part of my modeling as we were developing and reimagining the program of studies was um, Bedford High School. So I'm part of the informal state principals organization. And so we meet uh, twice a month um, on Zoom and um, we share a lot of this information, what's happening, courses, decisions that are being made at that level. And uh, uh, Bedford uh, repeatedly just had a really dynamic offering. And, and I said this once before that it, it Bedford as a model for me was they have AP, dual enrollment, and international baccalaureate. And I thought that's a robust ecosystem of opportunity for, for uh, families and kids. So, um, you know, we're gonna reimagine this as we move forward. We've created an academic standards council, and this is made up of students, faculty, and administrators. Um, I started that in the winter. So every, uh, even a concept, so it's not even a course, you know, even a concept for a, that might end up in the program of studies for a class um, is submitted to this council. And we use the National School Reform Protocols, or the old Critical Friends Group stuff that came out of Harvard Graduate School a long, long time ago. Um, we use protocols to engage you know, where this falls into our bigger visions and our priority growth areas around curriculum. Um, this timer wasn't working, so I'm not sure where I am on the 10 minutes, so please give me a little, yeah, give me a little heads up. I thought, the, I thought the timer here was not going. It never moved. <laughs> so I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> So the Academic Standards Council is really an important piece for us, um, and it creates a dialogue and a conversation around teaching and learning. And having kids at the table was critical. Um, and that was really important to me that this body, um, and, they, and it will change every year. There'll be different students, different faculty, um, but every, every teacher with an idea, every administrator with an idea that may result in a creation of a class goes before the council. And then that council is triggered through the protocols to support them through the professional development that it takes to actually develop a course, to think about equity, to think about curriculum mapping, all of the stuff that happens a year in advance. So our goal is to create a pattern of development and design so that we know what's in the pipeline for curriculum and instruction all the way down to the hopper. What are we gonna actually put in the program of studies? And once we have this pattern established, this system established, we'll have a much more, a better ability to communicate with the community about where we're at and where we're going. So um, that's just some background on the Academic Standards Council and how that factors in. Um, I wanted to walk us through a little bit of um, the survey results we got back uh, from, from our college partners. So in the fall, we actually did a survey uh, with our college admissions reps. And we got 93 respondents, which is really amazing. And the focus of that survey was on the, how colleges and admissions process uh, factors in weighted GPA and rank. So that's a really important little data set. Um, so I'm really excited about that. And Britt Lind, our college coordinator, um, counselor, kind of spearheaded that. And it's really just been a remarkable a bit of information and it also opened doors for new partnerships with our college partners so recently obviously when we wanted to really get more data around uh, the honors dual enrollment AP we came up with a, a, a brief survey um, and we wanted to really kind of gauge it so the survey is ongoing but right now we have 25 colleges and universities that have responded um, to us so and it's still open and we are getting new um, new results. So I'll zip through really quickly, because I'm sure the time is moving here. Um, it's my one pager. So um, the survey data was based on one, two, three, four, five questions, essentially. Um, and they really are unpacking the, the placement of things like capstone, ELOs, internships, portfolio projects, community service, travel, global exchanges and dual enrollment, AP, and honors programming. Um, so we really wanted to gauge um, when kids are trying to differentiate, when kids are experiencing a lot and have a really dynamic uh, body of work at the end of four years and they're moving on to the next steps that include college, 
Um, what is it like? So the first question was, to what degree do rigorous and dynamic learning experiences like capstone projects, portfolios, service, global exchanges, internships, um, influence or contribute to admissions decisions? 48%, um, it was a Likert scale, 48% had a significant positive influence and 36% had positive influence. And that was the first question, because I really wanted to make sure that we were looking at all student experience, that we weren't so focused on one set of criteria. You know, and I know our university partners look at, you know, really broadly look mm -hmm. at our student work. Um, the second question is really interesting, and the number and, and how we got there, I want to be able to explain. So the second question was, and this, the first part's important, assuming the high school's profile and for everyone who doesn't know, the school profile is written specifically for our college partners to identify the concrete systems of a school. Every school has one, and it is the guiding document for our college partners. It's a really important piece of information. So this is where we name our most rigorous, our, our weight, our ranks, all the systems we have in place. So the profile is a really important document. So the question was, assuming the high school's profile indicates that all are equal, how does your admissions process weigh the following in terms of rigor? Dual enrollment, AP honors, and IB courses. Um, our profile ranks them, the three that we offer, honors, dual enrollment, and AP, at a weighted rank of 5.3. That is our most that's the, the way we acknowledge that they're the most rigorous courses we offer, right? 60% um, of our respondents said that they view them the same in terms of rigor. Now here's, I wanna unpack this number a little bit because it wasn't as clean as that. Um, there was a lot of maybes, yes, if. Um, and what that came down to was traditionally, a lot of the reporting that we got was if you tell us your honors program is the same as AP and dual enrollment, we'll honor that from your profile, but they don't. That traditionally honors is not ranked at the same in many schools. So at many schools for us, honors is at 5.3 as the weighted rank, or weighted GPA. Um, other schools put it below. For us, that would be our accelerated program at 4.8 GPA. So, but since we do acknowledge those at the highest weight, um, they said we would. If you tell us that's your most rigorous courses, that we would honor that as well. So that's where that 60% came from. The big question in the room and in the survey was, would our students be at a disadvantage um, at your institution if they did not take AP courses, but instead took other dynamic honors level, capstone, internships, portfolios, dual enrollment, and 96% resoundingly said no, students would not be at a disadvantage. Um, for taking a dynamic collection of experiences and courses. Scenario one, I'm just moving through this quick because I, I know I, I'm over time, I'm sure, already. Um, uh, if you had two applications side by side and the applications were essentially equal, high GPAs, plenty of honored level classes, leadership, sports, clubs, but one student took more AP, the other took more dual enrollment, how would you, or would you, and then 84%, we would weigh them equally and look at the whole student, right? I mean, that's the admissions process. Um, so that was an important piece. And then the scenario two, the, the final question, um, which was giving uh, the admissions reps a, a way to just multiple choice, what would factor in? And this was a question that I've thought about for many years. And this is the scenario, the, this, besides the scenario that I posed in the survey, this was really important to me because you know, when you think about, there are 10,000 applicants for a school that has 2,000 seats for the incoming freshman class, right? Fairly standard ratio. Many of those kids will have top GPAs, top scores, top APs, you know, sports, varsity letters, blah, 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 blah. Theater, you know, everything. How do you differentiate? And so when we've created capstone projects, ELOs, internships, that's what I was interested in saying. How does that really factor in when they actually are equal, when these kids aren't differentiated on that non-demographic level, but just that student performance measurement, um, how does a college admissions rep really suss out other things? So the second scenario was you have two applications side by side. The applications are essentially equal, similarly, GPAs, top, plenty of success and honors, rigorous courses, 
um, leadership, sports clubs. Which of the following helps positively differentiate students with equal performance stats, barring other important non-performance indicators? Um, so resoundingly, internships, 75% of our college admissions reps said that's a differentiator. 43.8% capstone research projects. And then equally, 31.3% travel exchanges, global exchanges, and service learning. Those are really important uh, collect collection of data for us to really gauge where we're headed, gauge where we want to go. How do we increase with this 75% on internships? Now, we have a pretty robust internship program at Portsmouth High School. How else can we support it? How can we increase those opportunities for kids? So I'm really excited about this data set. I know we'll get more colleges in through the rest of the spring. Um, and that's, that's kind of, uh, again, information, knowledge. We, were, we weren't going to do this blindly. We really wanted to get the information uh, in and then out to the community and know that we're really thinking deeply about this work and opportunities for kiddos. Thank you. Did anybody time it? <laughs> All right. Well, and I'll say Steve's emphasis on time is because there is so much that Steve wants to talk to you about. Yes. And I'm, which uh, is included in, I mean, some of the yeah. material. I think when we were uh, developing uh, the agenda, we knew there was a, we wanted to make sure we yeah. had Steve in to talk specifically to, to the honors AP dual enrollment p portion and kind of had given him a time slot that was along those lines. So, <laughs> so uh, but I, I think you can, from some of the other things we've been given, that, you know, the high school is bursting at the seams to have a conversation with you about, yes, about we're very other excited. things <laughs> that they it's are good, up good to work happening. And, uh, and how this one piece fits within, I think, the idea of an ecosystem uh, is the right way to think about it. So, anyways, just want to mention that. Okay. Uh, wait, do we have any questions? I guess I'm sorry. Uh, are you going to go to point four? I know it's point four on the agenda, but the, off the last piece in our packet um, for you has the Office of Ingenuity's Idea Studio. Are you going to touch on that, or are you taking questions about the um, uh, yeah. survey first? Yeah, um, we were going to focus on the, the that big okay. the big push, but okay. on the honors AP dual enrollment. Stuff. Okay, I think Nick, you and have oh. Eventually, Matt will have oh. somebody on. Um, oh, okay. Matt has someone on Zoom. Okay. Oh, it's Kerry. Huh? Go ahead. Kerry has a question. Okay, we'll come back to her. Okay, let us know when she comes up. Nick, you and Brian. Um, yeah, so I'm side. curious about the Academic Standards Council, because yeah. um, I haven't heard a whole lot about that. So I was wondering, like, how many students are on there? How are they selected? Um, I think there was five students total. Um, we started with a bigger pool, but then as the work actually happened in the winter, um, and this was all set up right prior so late fall, I should say, so prior to the new year, um, and then followed through. Uh, what I discovered was um, that decisions on classes that were being added to the program of study had never, there was no system where it was kind of a conversation around curriculum and instruction. So my big push was I wanted to stop that. I wanted to make sure that we pushed conversations out. Um, and I think the students were selected across grade levels. So we had ninth graders, seniors, everybody in between, um, just a cross pollination from guidance counselors and faculty. So it was kind of a, we didn't, we didn't really know how it would go in that first pilot round. So we, we kind of handpicked, uh, but moving forward, uh, there'll actually be some meetings this spring, Nick, and it'd be great to get your help on that um, because the, some of the courses that were approved for next year have to move now into design mode and they have to move into the summer PD, the professional development work. Um, so we'll have students at that council as well um, to be part of the protocol process as student or teachers move from pitch to design. Yeah, I'd, uh, yeah, I'd be really interested to see like students be able to go to like pursue that proactively, like even if it was the administration's final decision who wound up doing it, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, having that be visible to students is yes. an opportunity. Yeah, guess. thank you. Yeah, agreed. 100%. I'd definitely like to see that. Yeah. Thank you, Nick. Brian? Uh, yeah, I'm just trying to understand a little bit how how these pieces work together um, between, because you, you talked about the course requests. You saw them go down, AP, a couple of these, like Spanish and French. 
went off and then you kept the physics one, physics two. So is the pathway to get classes back with an interest, is it through this uh, academic council or that that's what you kind of see it as? Like you want to bring back, say there's like a bunch of kids that want to take French. I'm just you yeah. know, using that as an example. Would the pathway for AP to come back would you have to go through this process or? Oh yeah, great. Okay. okay. Yeah, thank you. I think I understand. Um, uh, it could include the process. So what we've done, the, the Academic Standards Council has a, because of this, this conversation, we're also tasking every dual enrollment teacher, many of whom were AP teacher, you know, still are certified, but made the move. Um, we're going to do an audit on all these courses. So um, stats, for example, uh, will go to dual enrollment next year. We need to really understand its impact, both on the curricular side, the student performance side. So we're actually going to have the faculty lead the audit on where we're at. And then what I've told everybody is if we get to a conclusion where AP is a better offering, then we're absolutely going to go back. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, but it should be based on results. I mean, it's got to be based on, you know, a lot of our philosophy that we use, that I use in my leadership team is to say, um, we need to do things only differently enough to get better results. So we're not chasing shiny new anything. We have to do things differently enough to get better results. And that includes going backwards, if that's the case. Um, so if AP is the better choice, then we're going to go there. Absolutely. There's no doubt in my mind. Okay. Yeah. Looks like Carrie has her hand up over there. Why don't we go to Matt and then Katie and Lisa? Sorry. And Mago. Wait, where am I looking? So, uh, uh, so oh. Zoom. You'll be zooming it in a second. Oh, okay. <laughs> we think. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, yeah. hello. So sorry, um, I hope you're feeling great and had to step out. Um, I'm curious if you can, I, I love the survey. I love um, that we're being proactive on really understanding the parents' concerns. Um, one of the specific concerns was around you know top tier Ivy League schools, and I'm just curious if you could comment if any other respondents um, would be in that level, or um, kind of what the what the plan is for maybe sharing or disseminating these results. Is this something that you can, when you've gotten adequate responses, make available to other folks to the community? Yeah, absolutely. So first, the the, the tail end of that. Uh, Definitely want to share this out with folks, of course, um, and, and want a, a proper, you know, set of survey results, you know, numbers wise. Um, and in terms of the naming the colleges on this, uh, this survey in particular, um, yeah, I mean, we, we'll, I don't think we have, we didn't necessarily ask permission for that level of disclosure or anything, but we can have that conversation with our partners. I mean, they, they're, they work with us. So, um, yeah, and the and the the survey from the falls even has even a wider array of um, colleges and do include some top tier Ivy League schools. Um, so, yes, yeah, absolutely. So I hope that answers your question. It's a little nebulous, but yes, the data set we want to share with the community. Absolutely. Um, this was that summary just in terms of we just launched it right before break. Um, and, and even packaging that fall survey, I think, is going to be really important because I discovered that in the winter. I actually didn't know that happened, um, but I was really excited we have it in the 93 colleges. And that topic's going to come up, you know. There's a lot of schools that have walked away from rank and, and weighted GPAs, and we want to have a data set to open that conversation up for our community and really understand it before we make decisions or if we even need to make decisions. But, so, yeah, hopefully that, Carrie, that answered or helped. Katie. Yeah, thank you. I, oh. Is Carrie done? <laughs> thank you, yeah. Carrie. Okay. Katie. Um, great. Well, Carrie's first question, um, her question was my first question. Um, and you're saying that that will come out in time. Like, yeah. yeah. Um, so when you listed um, the part about ranking in order of importance and in internships were yeah. 75th percentile, what were AP courses in that list? Uh, no, th those were the, the 
Those were the givens of that survey question in particular. Um, the, the the fifth question where you asked them, the respondents, to rank in order yeah. of importance. Um, I, I might have missed it. You might have announced it. But I have, like, number one internship, 75%. Yep. Capstone, 43.8. Travel and service learning, 43.8. Was AP listed on? No. The so, the, so the given was that the students in that scenario, I'll read it again. You oh, have two applicants oh. side by side. The applicants are essentially equal in terms of student performance. Top GPA, GPAs, plenty of success in honors, AP, DE, IB level classes, most rigor, um, active student leadership, active sports, clubs. So given all that. Okay, sorry, yeah. I thought ranking them all in order of importance was the, was the last question. Yeah, no, just that was, um, yeah, given okay. those things of these other factors that celebrate our student success and our student efforts, okay. like ELOs, internships, capstone research, where do they rank those in okay. addition to? Yeah. Okay. I wish we did that without the givens. <clears throat> but I wish it was. I wish they could have answered it without the givens. Like in general, how do they rank AP classes? Um, yeah. So in the but, in the earlier question, yeah. um, where we got to the kind of the the sixty percent, I just moved all my yeah. notes around. So that only focused on honors, dual enrollment, and AP. I didn't give them a pick the top. So weighing them equally was where they kind of ended up in the survey, was that if, if the school profile says these are our most rigorous courses, right? we will, that, then yes, we will weigh them the way you have indicated them. Right. Schools that only offer IB, for example, if, if IB is the most rigorous track a school yeah. offers, or dual enrollment, or straight honors. There are many schools that just have their own homegrown honors program, right? That's not right. affiliated with the college or the college board or that they're just honors classes. Right. As the most rigor. And this will be my last question and I'm sorry to take up so much time, but oh, when okay. you were listing the, the survey results, when you were guys were deciding um, what courses to have, Spanish AP was getting, you know, roughly three people, you know, yeah. um, choosing that, whereas dual enrollment was 74. Was that the, those the same numbers for like MEH? Say that again. That was that the same response for MEH? Like, there's only like three people who wanted to do the honors or the the EP MEH. Yeah. So in the course catalog of 21-22. Yeah. So that was the, those numbers were the same. Uh, in Spanish, it was three AP requests against 74 dual enrollment. Mm -hmm. Modern European history, which is actually two courses mm -hmm. um, in dual enrollment, there were five requests for AP Modern uh, Euro, then 53 for the mm -hmm. Civ and Ancient Civ. Uh, French had zero AP requests. And this year, there's a little data set I did include, um, which was actually a big surprise uh, for me. Um, we ran physics in the catalog this year. Um, there were only seven requests for AP mm -hmm. or physics two and, and 12 mm -hmm. for AP physics one. Um, and we're meeting with the science team and talking about that. What is there something that we need to know about the AP courses? Mm -hmm. Now, one of the things that's that is underlying all of this is the block schedule, yep. right? So that's a factor that just has to be named. So when we are, when you have a course that's three quarters long, like mm -hmm. APs, it suddenly limits the number of additional courses a, a student can take. And I think that was just as a, my own analysis of the data sets that I looked at, those are families making decisions based on opportunity, mm -hmm. um, taking a DE, enables you with, to take a rigorous college course um, and have more time in your schedule for additional courses, whether they're electives or more DE mm -hmm. or whatever. So that's a major factor in our structure. Right. And then last question. So you were kind of citing Bedford High School as the model that you look towards being I loved, a robust I, I love the ecosystems so, that they offer for kids. It's a really great thing. Right. How do they determine... Uh, AP course registration, is it similar or different? Uh, like, would the same thing happen to them where people are voting to do dual? Oh, no, I don't, I don't think they offer side by side like we did last year. Mm -hmm. um, I think their, their courses are, they put out a program of studies as we did and, mm -hmm. and, and they're being selected. I don't know if they're having big conversations around a balance or a, a a different arrangement of courses. Mm -hmm. um, ours, you know, that conversation was happening obviously a year ago or more. Um, one thing I can report though, just because it kind of happened today, 
Um, so the dual enrollment, uh, and I hope folks know that dual enrollment is actually nationwide. Right. This is a major, major push from legislatures all over the country. Um, and the kernel of it, and it happened 20 years ago, called two by two in Massachusetts. Two years of, of a community college happening simultaneously, right? So this is a long standing uh, program that have been supported by all of the higher boards and, and, and uh, K-12 stuff. So uh, today, New Hampshire met their, their dual enrollment committees met today. Um, we were represented there, of course. Um, so it was really great, but we learned a lot about schools that are seeing the same kind of patterns emerge. Pinkerton, um, Bow, um, uh, Sanborn. So there's a lot of this is happening across the state where kids are choosing other different opportunities for rigor as well. So I'm excited to learn more as, as we talk with our partners across the state. Um, I just want to add this, though, I, because this is important to me, and I, I, I learned it this year, um, so it's actually really important. Um, again, like I said, I'm, I was proud. I was asked this question in my interview about dual enrollment, and my response was how proud I was for Portsmouth for offering more opportunities for kiddos, right? I, I didn't know all the background or anything like that. It was just really exciting to me. I'd seen a lot of schools try to offer other things. Um, and the, what I want to name here, though, is, is I, I've learned in, in the last couple months, dual enrollment specifically, and this is not a pro-dual enrollment or an anti, none of that stuff. It's really about um, when, it, when a child right now in our school has the opportunity to take the college-level welding, college-level culinary, college-level differentiation, right? College classes, college credit, I can't be any more proud of that, right? AP did it a great job. It still does. It's a robust national standard, all the above. It doesn't hit all of our kiddos, though, right? So by having the balance, by including this, I'm just really proud of Portsmouth High um, because all kids are being challenged with rigor, really, really robust opportunities, and that's, that's a beautiful thing. Um, Lisa and then Margo, and then Liz, and then we'll try to move on here, okay? I'll try. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm gonna try to ask this as succinctly as possible. I mean, the program of studies was a huge undertaking for the whole school this year, and certainly I think it gave people a new way to access what all of the <clears throat> options could be at the high school, and there's a lot, and it's a lot to take in. Yeah. And you spent a lot of time talking to parents at the high school, you know, a few weeks back at the PAC meeting in a lot more detail about all of these things, which I think people really appreciated. And the one thing I wonder if you can articulate, because you explained it really well that night, is for people who want to kind of understand what will my next four years look like? Mm. You know, what's the plan for kids who are starting to go through the high school now in terms of like, do you expect them to have a choice? between AP and dual enrollment, or do you expect to maybe stick with the dual enrollment path, or is it something you're gonna revisit each year? Because I think people just wanted to know a little bit what to expect, and you explained it really well to the few parents who came to that meeting. Yeah, I won't answer any reminders of what I said, but I'm glad it worked. <laughs> oh, no. Um, <laughs> Sorry. Um, you know, ultimately, I, I said it before and I'll say it again, um, we're in the business of creating opportunity. Um, the choices, some of this data set on, on the numbers of requests are really indicators of student family choices. Um, we will not be able to run side by side, right? I mean, that fiscally feasibility is a whole long list of reasons why we can't. Um, but my entire intention and our team, our whole leadership team, all the teachers, we're gonna be promoting this and doing this work every year. That's why the Academic Standards Council matters. Um, we get to create a program of studies every year. Um, and we're going to do that responsibly, uh, responsibly, and with the data that comes in every time we offer uh, a class. And I, what I don't want to get into the habit of is, oh, we've been teaching that for 20 years and no one's looked at it again. Um, I, want, I want our courses to be examined, explored, analyzed, the student results, student feedback. That was started last year as well, or I talked with student council actually in the spring uh, when I was doing my due diligence. And I'm, we need to get back to that. We need to get a consistent student feedback set up for every course um, and use that data to inform our choices as we move forward. Without that, we're, we're missing a big piece of our growth. 
But yes, so as parents are making those decisions, they absolutely um, should expect that our program of studies will always include rigor and growth for, the, for students. I think I want to simplify that question because with the block schedule, if it's AP, it changes how much time kids have to take yeah. steps. So just for planning their time in the high school, if they're going to need to have three quarters instead of two quarters available yeah. by, like, say, junior or senior year, yeah. um, how will that, you know what I'm saying? I mean, I don't know how to ask it the articulate way, but, like, if it's going to be AP, they need to have time in their schedule for that. And if it's going to be dual enrollment, then they maybe don't. Yeah, so with the cycle places. of the Academic Standards Council in place, uh -huh. um, we'll know what's on the docket before the program of studies is created. So the approvals will be in place before we go to publish. Gotcha. So okay. folks will actually have a heads up that's f three months, two months, f before the, the, even the published document comes out. No, that's super helpful. Yeah. Thank you. I and mean, that's, that's what we need that process for. Thank you, Lisa. Margo? Okay. I think mine is, well, first of all, thank you for the objective data because that was a big request from the parents and I... Um, I appreciate that, um, and for, not just parents, uh, the community request, sure. so I'll start with that. Um, three separate questions, but I'll start with one that tags off of Lisa. Um, I know both you and Zach have both stated at different points that it was a surprise to you, that it was a surprise to many people, <laughs> that this was a, considered a massive shift, yeah. right? And um, seismic shift, let's say. So on that note, given that we have a, a board goal of communication, I guess my concern, and this is sort of getting at what Lisa's asking, is how have we ensured that our rising 10th and 11th grade truly understand the choices that are available to them next year and how that could potentially play out? And are we making sure we've partnered with them to make the best choices? Because I guess the, the piece I'm struggling with mm -hmm having done scheduling at a high school for a long time is I'm a planner. I like to know this is what I'm taking in ninth grade and then I got this plan for 10th grade and if I take these then these are my options. If we're switching that in between a two quarter, three quarter, my options are very different in this track versus this track. And so for a student, they have to be very thoughtful about the courses they're taking to make sure they're creating the opportunities consistently each year with the rigor. So how are we making sure we're doing that? Am I asking that clearly? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I don't have a quick answer for you. I think, again, I go back to um, the time. I mean, if you're talking about planning four years in your, fr in your ninth grade year. Yes. Yeah, that, yes. <laughs> um, so I mean, that's not I wanted uncommon. you to say no, but that wasn't going to happen. Yeah, it's not um, uncommon. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So when you get to ninth grade, right, and you're like, oh, yeah, here's my four-year trajectory, mm -hmm. right? So what we know now is that there is rigor. There is rigor and opportunity, and it is absolutely on track for high performance, high push, you know, all that. Whether they're going to be, um, you know, to say, oh, yeah, there'll be 10 more APs next year, I can't answer that question right now. We haven't done our due diligence. And to say it's coming back just because, I, I wouldn't feel confident in, in naming that. Um, we need to really think through what's happening. We also need a data set. Um, I also, you know, in one of the meetings, I wasn't here, but there was some language around, the, oh, the, the teachers were just making this decision. I just want to be really clear, that was not the case at all. Um, I do rely on the faculty. They are the experts. They are the absolute responsible parties to deliver this, this work. Um, but my understanding of this kind of shift that was a surprise to all of us um, was really that it was an administrative decision that we should all be exploring dual enrollment. I just need to name that um, because that's my understanding of what happened in the past. Um, as we move through the Academic Standards Council, the goal would be that our faculty, our department heads, our administrators, our central office, our assistant superintendent for teaching and learning, that this is all part of that conversation on what the program of study is um, at Portsmouth High and, and what leads us there, K-8. Um, so, it, you know, I, all I can say is there will always be rigor for our students. Um, what shape it takes, that's what we're, we're going to get a handle on. Okay. Yeah. So then my follow-up to that, so is it, just so I'm clear, when, 
the answer that you gave to Brian, the audit that we're doing yeah. is assessing is the rigor where we feel it should be. Yep. And if it's not, then we all pivot our offerings. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And we're going to know in the fall. I mean, that's the goal is that we're going to know before the new year. Um, everyone, every dual enrollment that was an AP and made the shift, it's the same teachers, essentially. Right. So they're best suited to assess and audit the opportunity, the scope and sequence, the units, the lessons. Right. Is this it? Is this really what? And they also have their partners and their dual enrollment partners. They're still connected to the AP uh, support network and systems. So we're looking for that work to be really authentic. Um, okay, so then I'll tag team with my third question. Sure. Um, am I correct in understanding then in, in, in an ideal world, best case scenario for Portsmouth students is that the audit shows that the rigor is great so we can continue to offer it as a two quarter which increases opportunity because i think the anxiety i'm feeling and maybe it's because i have a, the grade level that my children are is that it feels a little bit unfair to our rising 10th and 11th yeah. that we could just wishy-washy yeah. it is 100 percent realistic that these ninth graders are saying, what do I have to take to get calculus? What do I have to take yep. to take next level biology? That's reality. And oh, if yeah. no, that we're happens every to day. them, yeah. uh, I just, I'm, I'm worried. So I, I no, no, like, let me, I want to clarify that because okay. that it's not that wishy-washy. The courses that are in the catalog get you to calculus, whether they come stamped with the college board logo or the University of New Hampshire or SNU or like the rigor is there and the pathway is already there. That's that's not missing. Nothing's missing in a family's ability to plan and prepare. It might, not, again, might not have the College Board logo attached to it, but it absolutely um, has been determined by our, our team to be a rigorous path to right. wherever they want to go. So I, I just want to no, clarify. Get, it's I not missing. There's nothing missing. No, no, missing. I'm not, I, it's not a rigor question for yeah. me because I think, and you, and you called it, and, and, and this is the last question because yeah. I'm not over speaking, but I, I do think the elephant in the room is our block schedule. And I do think those enrollment requests are driven a lot by our block schedule because that three quarter really limits what else you can take. And what they hear from colleges and what the survey says is diverse rigor, diverse rigor. So it, it's not hard to figure out, oh, two rigorous dual enrollments looks better than one AP with not a dual enrollment. And so I'm, I'm, I hope that the Academic Standards Council will look at. Yeah. If the goal is opportunity and rigor, then we have to figure out a way to do that in our block schedule where it's two quarters and we're not pivoting, we're heightening the rigor yeah. so that the opportunity is there. That's that's what I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that that's what that Standards Council will get it because the yeah. concern I keep hearing and we yeah. heard in that meeting was rigor yeah. and opportunity and planning and not yeah. not that anxiety of like i don't know what the plan is so yeah uh, thank you and i yeah I've reached good. no 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 i agree slightly. i agree and it is this is complex stuff this is really um and that's why i wanted to turn on all the lights that i could find mm -hmm. and shine a light on the information get real objective data sets so we could all talk together that's the <clears throat> ultimate goal steve but do you see the academic standards council as the vehicle to make that type of decision? It seems because there's, there's, there's some decisions that are courses inside of themselves and then there's a kind of a broader, maybe a, a broader conversation that's, um, I, I don't know. Do, do you see that in terms of this, like let's say the hypothetical rollback to AP? Yeah. But, um, do you see the Standards Council as the, the vehicle oh, for that dialogue? Okay, yeah, yeah, I think I process? got you. Yeah, it, there's actually two parts, and I named them. So yeah. the Academic Standards Council was originally created to um, be the body where any new courses were submitted and the conversation started. And then it would go through a design sequence to implementation, all the, you know, all the work we have to do. The, the little audit group is from the actual faculty who were AP teachers or dual enrollment. We need, we're giving them study tools to analyze the the effectiveness in, uh, of the implementation of these changes. I'm so, sure. okay. yeah, thank you. It's it's slightly different. Eventually, any course changes get to the academic standards, 
Um, but this is, a, this is a study led by our Director of Curriculum and Instruction, Chase St. Laurent. Um, that team is dedicated to study specifically our most rigorous offerings. Okay. Yeah, so connected but not, but different. Okay. Thank you, Zach. Liz and um, then Nick, and let's see if we can sum it up. So I, I might be oversimplifying or dumbing down, but when we had the meeting about AP courses and all the available options, um, really what I took from it was that um, physics, an AP physics class, may be, have been, be, be beneficial in a college admissions process because if you're comparing AP physics to AP physics when you're taking in somebody that wants to major in physics, right? So I guess I'm wondering, is, is, is there this, um, is that the notion and, and is there a way to sort of make that discrepancy when you're offering these surveys or offer a follow-up survey that you know maybe the admissions people are saying, yeah, we don't care about this, but maybe the admissions people from the physics department actually do. Uh -huh. um, so I guess I'm just a little bit curious because I, I, I guess that's really what I took. It, it didn't seem like, as far as the other courses, um, I understand rigor and whatnot, but to me it really seemed like the only course the sciences that where they're comparing AP to AP and other kids that are taking AP to AP and how are they doing um, and having that standard of curriculum and so I don't know if that's really a thing but that's sort of what I took from the from the dialogue and I guess I wonder if there's a way to follow up with that or understand that better so can I help you with the dialogue since you weren't sure there um, I, I think I had a different and I'll let people uh, chime in I think I had a different take so I remember for ex I think what we've heard in the past is that um, that schools are less likely to take subjects um, that are AP in the major their students are going to major in. Mm -hmm. So if okay. I'm like nursing, and I think Carrie used the example of nursing at, at UNH, they don't want the initial anatomy and physiology to be our AP version. They want the UNH version because they feel it's so fundamental mm -hmm. to their to their um, to their major. Okay. Um, so. Yeah, no, that that makes total sense. I don't know what I'm thinking of, but I don't know if there's certain admissions people that are like comparing those AP classes for certain subjects. I guess that's a notion that kind of came to me when we were, or I don't know if it, it had sort of been brought up, but yeah. um, but I totally understand what Zach's saying. And then I guess my uh, last sort of point that I wanted to hit on. Um, and I, I, we had our focus groups and, and uh, about how, what are, we want our graduates to do. And um, I guess I'm just wondering, as far as internships go, is there ever an opportunity to build internships into the daily schedule? I mean, obviously block schedules make it complicated, but um, how, I know this is sort of like off topic, but I, I mean, I think it is on topic in the fact that this is such a major thing that these schools are identifying. It, what is the high school doing now to engage students in internships? And is there, is there any opportunity in the school day to engage in sort of real life uh, work experience? Yes, actually we have a fantastic, uh, robust, dynamic during the school day uh, internship program. Mm -hmm. uh, Nicole Bellabana is our uh, internship coordinator, ELO coordinator as well, extended learning opportunities. Um, so one of the frames that we use is our flex block and so what Nicole does is set up industry panels. So over the course of the year, we have a number of industry panels. So it might be healthcare, and we'll get hospital reps, uh, tech, health tech startup reps, and they come in and present to the kids. Um, some of those offer internships, and so we're establishing that network. Um, and our students have uh, future planning block, internship blocks, and flex. So you can actually essentially, as a junior or senior, more seniors, I would say, you could actually factor in fourth and flex and lunch, essentially, um, for an internship. So essentially the entire afternoon, um, plus first block future planning as well. So yeah, there's actually a lot of opportunity during the day for our kiddos to be out in industry partners. And do they get credit for that? Like, yep. is that a, a course credit too? Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then do they have a learning component too, where like mm -hmm. they have to take, okay. All right. Yeah. It's really, it's amazing and, and well managed. And um, I know, uh, and I'll just give an example just real quick and then I'll move on. Um, I know uh, this is a thing that's across the board happening. Like obviously med school, you have residency, but when in, even in law school, that became a new idea in law school and law schools were having this, you know, internship residency component. And I just, you know, I just foresee that continuing to be the future. So, all right. Thank Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay, Nick, did you want to sum this up for us? Huh? Um, <laughs> bring it home, Nick. Bring it home, Nick. <laughs> so I just, I wanted to address 
one more concern I had, because I, I, we talked about this um, in an earlier meeting. I think McLaughlin mentioned that um, we that there was uh, that it was like a teacher push, and I know you addressed that too uh, towards dual enrollment, uh, where you thought felt it was administrative. And so after that meeting, I talked to uh, several teachers about it, and a lot of them said that, yes, we're very interested in pushing mm -hmm. towards dual enrollment. Yeah. Um, a lot of the teachers who said that had actually been doing it themselves. But I also noticed a lot of the teachers who had been teaching AP felt as though they were pushed into dual enrollment. Um, that, and that was not just like an isolated incident. That was several teachers I spoke to. Um, and so I'm just curious to hear how you're, like, how are you addressing that? Um, mm -hmm. Do you think the panel's going to hit that? And also, um, so I, I know we were talking about calculus earlier. Um, I talked to a couple of the math teachers, and my understanding is that the dual enrollment calculus that we're taking next year does not cover as much of the curriculum as the AP did. And I'm curious, um, is, there, is there a plan to fix that? Because that actually troubles me quite a bit. So a couple parts there. Yes. Um, so us addressing that is with the faculty who who know the work, who know the curriculum, who've designed courses, who've taught AP, worked with our college partners on the, on the dual enrollment. Um, so again, their assessment, their audit of that work has to happen in real time. So we're looking for this year coming up to really make those assessments. Um, the Academic Standards Council will eventually get the results from that audit led by Ms. St. Laurent. Um, so follow and give me the next part. Um, and then, yeah, so regarding specifically calculus, um, I think my, my Oh, yeah. yeah. So thank you. That's all I need. Um, yeah, this actually came up with many of the courses because, again, you go from three quarters to two, right? So it's, in some regards, it's just a time, it's just a time chunk, right? How do you do equal in less time, right? So the teachers have had to make those adjustments, look at the, the curriculum, the syllabi that come in, and really understand what it is. So if our you know, if the syllabi comes in from Great Bay, SNU, UNH, wherever, um, those decisions are made. We're, we're required to teach the course as is by virtue of getting the college credit. We're not making up our own. Um, again, our hope is specific to STAT, specific to AP French, specific to all of them. Um, what do we know? And what's, again, back to, I think, Margot's point, the idea is we need to understand what that rigor really is. Less isn't always less in the big scheme of things. Um, again, to the point that Dr. McLaughlin makes around when a lot of the schools say, no, 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 we'll take calculus from here. Thank you. But we, we want our, our uh, you know, anatomy and phys the way we do it. Not discouraging a student from taking AP um, phys, but they're not offering any credit at UNH. They're not offering advanced placement credit. Um, because they want to start, but please go for it. I mean, that's what we hear a lot is go for it. Take calc any way you can. You're probably going to take it again in an engineering program mm -hmm. at any big university. Mm -hmm. that, that's just gets to that departmental level. So, but again, I'm looking to <laughs> the, the faculty and I'm also looking to the students. What I mentioned earlier tonight was last year, I know the student council had started a real push on getting um, the feedback forms for every teacher. We need that. We absolutely need that to be active and everywhere so we can really get the appropriate information. Okay, Danielle wants to sum this up for us. Super quick. Yeah, super quick. Um, I First of all, I just completely appreciate the dialogue that is happening around here and in turn the value we're putting on kids' desires. What I'm wondering is if at some point in the future when we go to ask the questions of the kids, if, if they were equal time, if they could do AP for, yeah. for dual enrollment, would Great they? Question. Or And or if we could get creative around the scheduling where the APs were the last block and instead of a flex, they took extra time and somehow we could squish that into a two, two yeah. order thing, would that be more enticing? Because I do know we, we have done this fantastic job of providing <coughs> lots of opportunity. We never want any part of our demographic to feel like they may be lost at the expense of, um, and finances are a thing. You know, I hear loud and clear, you can't run both of them. However, if we ask them apples for apples, if we got creative around, would there 
would those numbers at some point okay. in the future yeah. and would it be certain courses and not others and that makes the decision super easy okay. for us yeah great wonderful creative idea yeah that's great thank you yeah okay thank you steve Woo. thank you you're done <laughs> yeah. no 10 minutes Nancy. 10 minutes Ten. wait hold on what's this last piece though the office of ingenuity's idea That's studio for us to read chair yeah. you have to decide on that okay we're not I, doing that tonight no, no I, we're not doing that no tonight. another time we'll, 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 we will definitely we'll definitely do it another time what did you Nancy. Uh, Car carrie's got her hand up uh, carrie we're we're ready to move on did you have something quick you'd like to say I did. My apologies. I don't think I think I was waiting for a little bit. Um, I think I think see one of the things that you brought up in related to the calculus and the requirements. I think as you're putting out more information related to the feedback you're getting from colleges, um, that's a really critical component. Um, so as a nursing professor, you know we don't we actually would encourage more like science based curriculum. Um, at higher levels as opposed to like a health professions program. Um, we don't accept A and P, you know, from any transfer, dual enrollment or anything. And so I think that's a really important piece um, to get out there is understanding that the core courses for a major are often required at the university. Mm -hmm. So I'd love as this develops to, you know, have that component be developed as an education for parents and students as well yeah thank you agreed yeah okay all right now you're out take two <laughs> now you're out again <laughs> thank you steve thanks steve <laughs> um okay <laughs> now we'll move on to the superintendent's report the first item is the superintendent memo and i, I will um go through it you have it it's not a bunch of detail the one i'll just highlight the um i want to mention uh in connection the first piece just that i want to make sure the board was aware and the community was aware that as we um continue to monitor the the case connected with the um individual who's with the alleged threat i'll use those types of language in in respect to uh the person still needing to go through the criminal justice process uh the lead in this case uh the the um the U.S. Attorney's Office, federal side of things, is, is taking the lead uh, in the case, uh, and they've been excellent uh, in uh, two ways, in ways that were not totally anticipated. Uh, we have a, uh, a, it's called a witness victims advocate uh, who works directly with, with us, um, as they would anyone else who's involved uh, potentially as a victim of a federal crime. Um, that person their job is to liaise with us on a regular basis and if we were an individual citizen it would be the same thing but in our case they're looking at the school district as the victim uh, and so they are keeping us abreast of kind of process um, what we can anticipate in terms of timelines um, kind of where we're at and they're going to have an ongoing conversation with us in addition to that that particular person then connected us with the the actual assistant US attorney who is, is prosecuting the case um, and we, uh, members of our team, Patty, myself, Steve, I can't remember if anyone else was on that call. That was it, it was just, just three of four us. of us, yep. Um, were, uh, had an opportunity to uh, meet with the assistant U.S. attorney, talk through kind of where uh, the case was at. There's some things we can share, some things we can't um, that were part of that conversation. Um, but I think the um, the things that people would be most, most kind of concerned about uh, early on were around the possibility of the individual being um, Release, people were thrown out bail, released on bail, um, and the federal system doesn't do um, bail in the same way as the state the state system does. But we do not anticipate that um, through the next couple of months, at least, if not longer, um, as the the federal authorities are going through their process, that this person would be mm -hmm. uh, outside of custody. Um, and as we have more information about where you know where this is going to where this is going to go and what that looks like obviously we'll report back to you and report back to the community um but i, I will say that the the u.s attorney's office has been excellent mm -hmm. um, and uh it's my first experience with um federal the the federal prosecutors uh and um and uh it was top-notch the type of treatment we received mm -hmm. so far 
Um, so in response to that, you know, obviously the, our, their kids took a strong response today. They want action um, towards gun violence. And, and so I was thinking uh, from a legal perspective, you know, what more could we do as a board or what more could I do as a citizen having been affected by this situation, having had been out of school and out of work sure. with my son? Um, and I guess I'm wondering if we could direct our legal department to consider a civil action against um, this person as well. Um, obviously, they, uh, I know that there's, um, you know, there's uh, certain civil um, versus criminal actions that can come about um, through the justice system, but I, I guess I did wonder if we could direct our legal department um, to consider a civil action against this gentleman. Obviously, um, you know, I, I, I'm not expecting they're going to get some sort of payout or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, but I, um, I just wonder if there could be some sort of something that could come from a civil action uh, in that sense, in how it affected our day, it affected our, our staff, it affected our families, it affected our kids. And, um, you know, even if it was like a class action, civil action type situation, I just wondered if we could direct our legal department to um, consider the possibility of, of throwing one out there. I can definitely consult with with um, with the, the, the legal department of the city about about that. I, two two different thoughts on that. I mean, it's not the um, yeah. It was it was it was the uh, you know families, all the different people that were affected as a result of the the decision that this person allegedly made. I'll keep using that language um, um, and the impact it had across the city. And I know that you know was we were wrapping up. Oh, I think it was day two. Um, you know, I, I had an opportunity to, um, the, the city manager and I were both just like wiped, been a pretty long day, and we were just talking about, you know, the impact. We weren't even down to the family level. We were just talking across both the school and the municipality. The, um, even you should just look at it through the financial impact on all the different kind of um, parts of the city of Portsmouth that that uh, had to expend uh, energy, human resource, et cetera, uh, as a result of this. It's big. The other part I'll say is that in our conversation, you know, within um, within the federal system, there's also the opportunity to request, and this would be this would not. We might want the standalone opportunity of a civil a civil action, but within the federal system is the opportunity for restitution mm -hmm. as part of uh, what might be a potential outcome. Yeah. Um, so that's another, you know, as we continue to have dialogue as they move along in their process, it could be that that's, if, if yeah, monetary I, damages was the that's interest. That's not what I'm looking for. I, yeah. I think, um, you know, the, sometimes the way you get statutory change is through civil action versus criminal action. I mean, you think about somebody getting arrested for, you know, hitting somebody with their car. Well, they might go to jail for a year because they were drunk driving, but was that really justice? No, this, the justice usually comes through a civil action, and um, a lot of the civil action can create statutory change. And if we're the first, you know, school in the country to, to do a civil action against somebody like this, uh, I would be all for it. I, and I, so I guess I just wonder, I mean, obviously there's resources and time that mm -hmm. would go into something like that, but I, I guess I wondered if we could direct our, you know, the school board could direct the, um, the um, uh, 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 our council or even seek private counsel um, to create some sort of civil action because I think it could potentially um, create some sort of stuff, you know, some sort of legal change or, or create some parameters or set some precedent of, mm -hmm. hey, if you do this, guess what's, guess what's coming for you? It's not right. just going to jail. Um, so, okay. okay, thank you, Liz. Thanks. That's a good suggestion and we'll follow up on that. Um, I think, you, I know we have time oh, short, but I just want to say one other thing around. Um, we've had a lot of people, I think there's been conversation at the council level um, and around from public officials in their in their capacity as elected elected public officials, uh, talking about a variety of different solutions to the problem that is school violence and school safety. Um, and um, so we, I just want to make sure the board knows that we you know we've been approached by groups who uh, are interested in advocacy positions, whether whether that be around mental health or that is around um, around guns. Uh, in gun uh, legislation, and our position is as, as a school district, as a we're not, we are not um, elected representatives of the people. We are professionals who who work uh, for the public. As we don't, you know, generally we do as an institution. We are not taking um, advocacy uh, advocacy positions around those types of things. The board could, um, other folks could, but we are um, um, trying to walk that line. 
we have our own personal sets of beliefs around, I think each of us is, as uh, professionals who work in this field have our own set of beliefs around um, advocacy, uh, you know, work that might should be done at Concord. Uh, and uh, but as a as an institution, we are being careful about um, my personal beliefs do not necessarily reflect the institution's beliefs. So um, and that might be something the board would be have taken interest in. So. Okay, thank you. Um, did you want to have Patty present now or what? Um, I, the only, I would just say the other stuff that's in there, I, I think is all good information for the board to have in terms of the okay. construction management stuff. I'm not going to go through it all okay. where we're at with paraprofessionals and the ongoing portrait of graduate work, um, all stuff that I would just encourage you to make sure you're reviewed. Um, and then we've had conversations and I'll set up Patty here. We've had some conversations about, um, just giving in the light, in light of where we just had been, um, giving the board some information around kind of safety and some of the safety work we've been doing mm -hmm. that is that is not did not start with what just happened uh, and uh, Dr. Haynes our assistant superintendent has been um, leading uh, our work in in reviewing um, uh, what we've been up to and then trying to get us set up for next steps so I asked uh, Dr. Haynes to give us uh, give you uh, kind of a brief summary of some of the work we've been up to so this is an ongoing conversation, as you know, at least at least a decade, if not more, we've been concerned about school safety. And just to sort of frame this up for you, schools um, have already had in their possession an emergency management flip chart. Uh, the district did put into practice recommendations that were made in 2018 by the Department of Homeland Security School Safety Preparedness Task Force. That was something that happened that was already in place. And there were evacuation drills, ALICE drills, all those things had been in place since prior to COVID happening. And teachers have been receiving ALICE training from Sean Kennedy of the Portsmouth Police Department. So that's all sort of been in place. Just this school year so far, so just thinking back this school year, um, we have established the district safety team and we are meeting monthly. We've had regular meetings since January, getting things stood up and running. This team includes school administrators, central office administrators, representatives from police and fire departments, and our director of facilities. And we regularly meet and discuss topics about school safety. The first thing that we did is we went through a safety audit and we use the Partner Alliance for Safer Schools, it's PASS, P-A-S-S, -S, School Safety and Security Checklist. Now this checklist is comprehensive information about best practices about securing school facilities. It was vetted by experts across education, public safety and industry, and it takes a layered approach to security. So going from the classroom level all the way out multiple layers to make sure that all those different levels are covered. Um, we looked at each building, did a complete audit for the checklist that was available through this um, partner alliance and we identified what components we had in place and what components we needed to put into place and we are in planning phases right now to make those updates and to figure out what needs to be put into place. Um, Alice training for all staff has been completed at each of the facilities. Students have practiced some drills and our building safety teams are collaborating in a similar manner so that we've got a through line of communication sort of happening recursively between the district team going out to the buildings and then coming back. Um, part of our school safety strategy also includes work with social emotional learning, SEL, and promoting positive school climate because we know that that's an important piece. It's not just hardening the facilities and making sure that we've got, you know, different physical aspects in place, but making sure that our students feel that they're safe and welcome. So we've got our social worker and our counselors meeting with students and families, providing support in an ongoing manner. We've also got our new SEL program rolling out at the elementary schools. There's additional work with SEL coming with the middle and the high school as well. Further down the road, and we're talking about probably starting over the summer, getting a lot of this into place, and then kicking it off at the beginning of the next school year, we're looking at bringing on board Navigate 360, which is a portal that would include ALICE training for all of our staff. This would be 
online sort of training. They would still be participating in physical activity. But all of our staff, including our substitute teachers, custodians, other people who are in non-classroom positions so that they know what to do in case of an emergency, also some other sort of safety components are included in that, things like bloodborne pathogen, all of that safety. We would be looking also at bringing on board something called an emergency management suite. And this suite would contain an app that could be put on phones, iPads, and would have a virtual flip chart, which would be updated regularly. So if telephone numbers changed, if leadership changed, we would just update it in the virtual flip chart. All of that information would be out there. There'd be other features that could be used by first responders, so that's going to be coming on board probably next year. And we will have continued work with our social emotional learning and belonging for students. Some of that work is going to be reflected in the portrait of the graduate. Some of that's going to come through strategic planning, but that's another through line that we've got in place. I will share additional detailed emergency preparation information with the school board in a non-public setting. Mm -hmm. And that's where we are with safety. Thank you, Patty. Are there any questions for Patty or Zach about that? Um, okay, I know Zach, um, in our meeting with Zach, for, to prepare for this meeting, we talked about the um, interest of the council to support us and to support the school board in whatever changes, additions we would think we would like to make. I know one counselor has made a request for SROs at our elementary schools, so I guess what we can do is ask Zach and Patty to study that issue for us and other issues that you may think we should um, provide for our schools and we can seek the um, financial support of the city if, um, if we feel that's necessary for our schools. So I'm kind of putting it into yep. your basket, yep, that's, you and that's Patty, good. and yep. let us know as soon as you feel it's appropriate and we can go to the council and ask for whatever funding we think we need to to accomplish those um, her priorities. Okay, let's have Lisa and then Liz. Thanks, Nancy. I guess I appreciate that people are going to look into this and put some thought behind what the best ways are to make our kids safer and our teachers safer inside our buildings. That's certainly everybody's goal here. Um, I guess I would just like to think through if we are publicly speaking about these issues as private citizens. I believe our board speaks as one voice and I would like to make sure that going forward that we are not going out individually and speaking in the media about a board position that isn't one that this board has actually taken. <laughs> um, you know, I know that everybody's passionate about it and may have different opinions, but I just want to make sure as we go forward, like I know we have lots of people who are on our council who have lots of different ideas. Many of them are parents. They are understandably worried about their kids' safety, about our community safety. But I think it's really important for us to make sure that as we're making decisions about the best strategy for the district, that we make it as a group in a public meeting and not as individuals in the media. Well, I think, and, I think we do that. I think um, we always do that. I, I think, think there's been we, some letters for the editor that have been advocating specifically for SROs, and that was not a position that was made by the board. It wasn't a board. It wasn't a board position of well, that. Well, <laughs> okay. I mean, there, there were suggestions that were suggested, but there was never a, a, a statement that said the board thinks we should have SROs. There was okay. a there were many suggestions that have been put out there since this happened. But there was, not, uh, there was not a declaration that the board said we should have SROs in our elementary schools. Okay. Or we should have whatever. I mean, okay. it was, it was um, not a declaration of this board. Okay. Liz. Um, I, guess, um, I guess briefly to that, I'm not exactly sure what, the, what that is all about, but I, do, I know Margot did send an email to the board, and I just want to be careful about creating quorum and sharing, because I do think you shared it like, a lot of great information. I haven't delved into it, but I, I do want to say that's why I've always advocated that um, board members also be able to do public comment because that's essentially what that was um, in sharing that information. Um, I guess another thing, I, if, if I, I didn't realize that, that this was sort of on the agenda for us to add stuff to as far as school safety um, for you to look into, but it's always been concerning to me. Like I, the first day of school at Dondero was great. It was like. I was like, okay, I was just pumped up for the school year. Um, but 
you know, there's staff that are standing there. They're not helping kids out of the car. There's like, there's kids that are playing in the playground area. And so I just, um, I would really like to look at those morning processes. And I guess I do think the middle school got it, you know, got it, got it as close to right as they possibly could in how they uh, uh, look at kids in the eye every day when they come in the door. Um, I don't know that the elementary schools are doing that. I'm not sure exactly what the high school is doing, um, but I'm a little bit concerned, you know, I, having lived down south and in other schools, you know, people are helping kids out of the car, you know, in, instead of just staff sort of standing there um, and having conversations with parents and whatnot. So not to say that it's all bad, um, but I, I do think that would be a really good thing to look at is um, the entrance into school every day and what that looks like at each school. Um, is that, that's it for me. Thank you, Liz. Okay. Oh, Pip. Um, I just wanted to thank Patty for that, that report. Is you were very quick and concise, which is most appreciated. Most appreciated, and um, but also it's really helpful to hear what has been going on. On and um, I'm encouraged that we're going to get some more information in non-public. Um, and I also wanted to piggyback a little on what Lisa said. I, I agree that it's very important that we, going forward, that we all represent um, ourselves individually and and don't identify ourselves in relation to the school board if we're sharing our personal opinions and then. Um, and then as we do go forward, that we come to an agreement as a board before we make any changes. All right, I guess I'm confused. I got a call from the Portsmouth Herald, and they said, as the chair of the school board, can you make a statement? This was a very serious event that happened in our schools. I felt that in my position as the school board chair, I should make a statement. The mayor had made a statement. I felt I should make a statement. I did say to the reporter more than once, I am one of nine. He did not put that in the story. They edit what they want to put in a story, okay? I wrote a, 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 a letter, which I thought was a letter to the editor. It ended up being, I forget how, what they called it, um, whatever. I mentioned several times, I am one of nine. He said, we would like a statement from the chair of the school board. I felt it was my responsibility to make that statement. Now, if, um, I'm sorry if I offended anybody, but I felt that that was my responsibility, that the school, the school board chair had to make a statement, like the mayor made a statement and others made statements. No, I, I don't know about so your I don't, statement. I, 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 I that's, may be that's how that, that That's how that unfolded. I may be confused between the letter to the editor and the article. I was the, the two art two uh, yeah they were there were I guess I'm confused too I don't I don't remember well I think I, I mean I I'm expressing my concern going forward I think that we've had we've had some difficulty with this before and I think it's just important to reiterate right. but if you get a call like that from a reporter because something very serious happened in your school district and you are the chair of the school board and they're asking you for a statement you have the responsibility to make that statement I would agree with that. Okay. Yeah. And Nancy, I agree with that too. I think it was the letter to the editor that advocated specifically for adding SRO positions to the elementary school. They were suggestions. Signed. They were all suggestions. I never ever said this is the the, the, the goal of the school board. I said though, some of the, the things we of the could board. talk about as a school board mm -hmm. are SROs. I said uh, metal detectors at the entrances to our schools. I said bulletproof windows on the first floors of our schools. Those were all things we discussed years ago when this came up and we hired a consultant. I said they were suggestions. I never ever said it was the will of this board to do that. I threw out some suggestions. I, I, when you I, throw out suggestions with the weight of the chair of the school board behind them I did say the that I did board. say I am one of nine and that did not get reported well this was a letter to the editor well I, I think I said that in the letter to the editor too they edited my letter to the editor okay okay I just want to make that clear because we're in a situation that's emotional people are upset it was a horrible thing that happened in our community and I get a call from the newspaper is the chair of the school board and I felt I needed to make a statement. 
Liz. I guess I just want to advocate again, like, because I, I didn't read any of these, and I'm trying to access them on Seacoast Online, and I don't pay for Seacoast Online right now, so <laughs> I can't even see what your suggestions are, and so that's why I want to continue to advocate for public comment, because I would love for you to get a public comment and do your three minutes of what you think that we should look into, or or maybe we put it on the agenda, or I guess, if, or have a focus group or something once Patty you know, looks into some of these things. I didn't know that this was on the agenda tonight, and if I knew that we were going to sort of be having this discussion more, I mean, obviously I should have figured, you know, after an incident like this we'd be having this discussion, um, you know, that maybe there's more that we we should be talking about or ideas and kind of, you know, give that space for that opportunity to discuss. Yes, well, we're leaving that up to Zach and Patty now, and they'll so, get back to the board. Well, I was going to say, just in terms of the sequencing, though, of that, in terms of this upcoming yeah. fiscal cycle, so so we are, you know, Nathan and I, and these won't be part of the slides, but we're finishing up our slides because the city council has their big all-day budget meeting on the on Monday, um, the 15th, and so we're finishing up our slides. We have very strict things that we're supposed to respond to and inform the city council of. Um, I think we are, you know, anticipating the SRO question will be part of what when we have questions from the from the council based on some positions taken by some city council members. Um, we also have had some conversations which would indicate there's an op there there is probably a uh, openness to having some conversation about some additional items that we might we might desire. Um, and um, but I I do think that at the moment uh, in conversations internally there's a lot uh, in terms of SROs there's a lot of questions internally amongst mm -hmm. um, amongst administrators about um, every, and everyone starts in the position of they really want everyone to be safe but there's a you know administrators um, an SRO and I think part of this also goes to the the police department's ability to even uh, hire those positions, train those positions, how long it would take to get those people uh, into those spots. But then on the school side, um, you know, a very, very small portion of what an SRO does is by the door or somebody in the building with a gun in the event of someone else is coming with a gun. So we have a, there's a lot of internal conversation about do, do we have, have we thought this out yet? Have we thought out this portion of things? And, and, um, and that between now and um, Monday, um, I don't. I don't see me and my position being in a position to advocate for additional SROs in this budget cycle. Um, that Isn't that something we would need to vote on, though, right. before you even bring it there? Yes. So, I mean, we vote on the budget. You make the decisions, I sure, guess, right? Sure. Sure. No, the city, I, the city council votes on the budget. You've already proposed your budget, but the council is. But as far as creating budget. a new position, isn't that our like? Isn't that under our purview as far as what we? So I guess basically we decide, okay, we want so much for a budget and that's really all we get. <clears throat> like we don't get the opportunity. Like, I mean, I feel like we've gone through this process and we went through the process and SRO came up, um, you know, briefly in this, in that sense. And I don't think we delved into it. It was kind of, you know, but I guess I just wonder like, where do we draw the line as far as creating new positions and having a superintendent offering up a new position where, where we haven't necessarily they'll, you know, agreed on that or something. So, yeah. let, me, so let me, and Nathan, you correct me because you have more experience, going, but yeah, the, yeah. Um, so the, the experience usually has been not the addition of things, it's been the school, we go, you, you, we have worked with you guys to develop a, a proposed budget uh, for the city, um, for the school department uh, that you have approved, and then we go, and then we, the, the, you know, Nathan and I, I think in most years we get beat up by the council about why do you need these things that your school board is saying that you need, um, and then we would need to defend those things and would pro and could be in a give and take process with the city council where there's no time to come back to you. We have to on the fly say, well, geez, I hear you, council. Yeah, I think Steve so -so. actually pulled some stuff back. Yeah, but and we then, never really talked about him pulling what exactly was going to get pulled back. I think too. right, and it's not, and they're in the city council at the point where. They're going to decide whatever they decide at that point, and we're not. We're no longer. Our board is no longer in a give and take conversation with the, with the city council. We're there trying to do the best we can on the fly. Advise the city council as to what they should they should fund or not, knowing that we're there to represent your budget because you've sent us there. Now, what the problem is with the challenge with this is, is that 
this second event, which comes on the heels of the of the December, December, December January, November, um, the hoax, the hoax, the hoax yeah. uh, event. Um, that we so this the, this second event comes on the heels of that, and the second event comes after we were completely done with our budget process, mm -hmm. and there has been this very active conversation I think among city councilors about whether or not SR, adding SROs across the, the district or in some form is the solution to the problem, um, and um, and that's happening all inside of this period of time in between, mm -hmm. and city councilors knowing if they don't do something about if that was the interest and they didn't do something about it on Monday or the meeting thereafter, the meeting right after that, then they've lost, they will have lost their opportunity for a whole nother budget cycle to, and the position wouldn't necessarily, like in the positions we have right now, we contribute yeah, from it's our 50%, budget. Yeah, percent right, or something like that? And far less than okay. that, I, was my understanding. We, we, we essentially contribute half of one of the SROs. So they basically would demand us to put it into our budget? Not it, clear. Potentially? Well, I mean, I guess what I, that would be and how. I mean, technically, our budget is their budget. Right. I guess we are them. I guess it's a, so, it's a strange nuance of being a dependent department rather than an independent school district, and it's different than where I've been prior to coming here. But I would right. say there's another step to that, which is the board doesn't really adopt a budget. The board recommends a budget to be included in the city's budget. So we recommended a sixty million dollar budget based on everything that we have uh, analyzed and contemplated and priority set. That's now been folded into a $137 million proposed budget that was put in front of the council last night. I, we haven't really had the opportunity, but I should tell you that one of the things that's in that didn't make it, one of the things that we wanted to do didn't make it into the city manager's proposed budget. So the budget that's in front of the council right now to, for consideration is not the school board's budget, it's the city manager's budget. And we've already, we've already um, had to take two of the positions we wanted to move from ESSER into the budget, into the district budget, those have been pushed back. They'll have to ride in ESSER again for another year. And we'll make clear in the process, like we did last year, okay, the two that are in the budget, hopefully will stay there, the two that we've already had to push out in the city manager's assessment of the bigger picture of how we fit with police and fire and public works and all of the other general government elements to um, <clears throat> building that bigger budget we've already had to manipulate we've had to massage or manipulate and it's not like zach and i sat down and said oh yeah we don't like this we don't care about this one let this go it was mm -hmm. here's a line in the sand and in order to fit within the rest of the cities and uh, you know proposal there's some changes that had to be made and my understanding of the process in the years i've been here and the years before is it's always been like that and there's always some massaging that has to happen at the city level at this point, I think if the city council is determined that there are priorities they want to add or delete from the bigger package, then we then we 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 ultimately end up with that. It really isn't our budget at this point; it's our piece of their budget. Um, and I guess the only other suggestion I would make, like you've lived in other environments, or like Zach and I have lived in other environments, yeah. um, you don't necessarily have to do what the plan might have been by somebody else. City council thinks here's $100 and you should spend that to buy candy. You might decide it's not within your, it's not within your plan to buy candy in school. You might wanna go buy paper with it. And I don't think that's an issue so long as you stay within the appropriation that you've been authorized by the council. I didn't mean to lecture. That was just, yeah, no, there's, that a, multi, no, 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 but there's a multi-stage process that's really quite different, I have to tell yeah, you, because we're ramping up and doing budget again now, and in most of my life, I was done back in March. <laughs> yeah. Right Now we have to remember everything we were talking about in January, February, and, and start over. So it's, a, it's interesting, for sure. If I could just say something, though. However, if we, let's say this board decided that we needed three SROs at our three elementary schools. That's a high budget item, which we, of course, could not, our school budget could not absorb that. No. In that case, we would have to ask the city council for, I guess they call it a supplemental budget, or you know, if, 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 we, if we as a board really felt that we needed those three SROs and made the pitch to the city council, we would have to ask them to well, pay for it. And, and you know, I, I think too that it's, is it just three SROs? Because what about Lister? Mm -hmm. uh, and is it one SRO? Is it four SROs? We need is another it, teacher. You know, um, and well, in yeah, and what's that other impact, right? Right. So, so it's a future discussion, and if Zach and Patty could flush out some of these um, requests for us, we as a board would vote on them and then take our information back to the city council. 
How, and does, I, that, how does that sound? I mean, does that sound like yeah, a good Yeah, I think so. I, I mean, I anticipate that we will be asked on Monday about SROs yep. um, as part of our um, budget presentation to the City Council. Um, so do we need to take a position tonight? Like, I mean, as far as a vote of whether, like, we would yay or nay or, or, or pros and cons or I don't know. I mean, I guess if you're going to have to make that pitch on behalf of the school board or on behalf, you know, from... So I'll I tell you, my, my position based on conversations with administration, thinking about the logistics, thinking about the finances that are connected with that without board direction, I would, you know, my, uh, if asked by the city council, I would say that currently we would not be interested in, in moving to, you know, three additional SROs that would not be our uh, recommendation. Is there a, is there an in between though? Is there like a I mean right now we have the police officers you know parking their cars and sort of standing there with their hands in their pockets for lack of better I mean not to you know just just you know but like you know talking to other parents or whatever it's yeah. not like they're you know standing at the door or sort of walking around and looking at the scene or you know what are these kids doing what's going on in the woods you know it's not like a you know. A, you know, I think you know the presence means something, right? But I think that it's like, what are we? If, if they're going to be on on school property doing, you know, maybe there should be a directive of like, you know, shaking kids' hands, high five them in the door, looking them in the eye. You know, I don't know, you know. Yeah. And so, what does that look like? And so, I guess I wonder if they're already doing it, right? If they're already showing up twice a week, three times a week, or whatever it is, you know, why don't we keep it going and have them there, you know, certain times a day or? or random presence so you'll never know when he's there but he's going to be there you know um and you know have it but have some sort of directive or something i mean that would be my instead of saying no way because i think that we've heard so much feedback from parents that they they think this is the solution i think but we've seen some research that maybe it's not this you know uh full-time solution but maybe there is some in between um so i would throw that out there and and, and maybe suggest suggest an, a happy medium here I think my recommendation is I think we should pursue this conversation after Zach and Patty give us recommendations of what they think would be the best for us and if we have to go to the council for a supplemental budget then we'll do that. So let this budget go if we need if we feel we need that say for the fall you know to start school in the fall then we'll do that. If we need metal detectives to start school in the fall then we'll go and ask for that money. If we need whatever I'm throwing things out these are not my opinions trust me I don't think we need metal detectives but I'm just trying to throw out some um, examples to make my story here. I think we should let this budget go ask Patty and Zach to examine what they think we need come back to the board the board will decide and then if we need to ask for additional funding we will. Okay. May I jump in? Yes. Apologies. Um, I didn't realize Matt had gone um, for the night. Um, so uh, just a couple things, and I'm apologizing, I'm backtracking a little bit, but I, I think it's, I think I would agree that we need a presentation of what it is and also what the evidence is and how, you know, we balance the evidence with our need. Um, but I do want to jump back to the press comments and the statement. I think um, I, and I can totally appreciate and understand um, the really immediate nature, um, but I do think in general it's a best practice to have talking points go out to the board um, for, you know, even if it's a super tight time frame of, you know, this is, I need to talk to them in two hours for it to go to press. Um, I think I would appreciate that opportunity as a board member. And I am not quite sure where the, in the agenda we are, but are, what, did this come out of the budget and performance measure report? Is this a time or are we going to that? I, I don't know if I understand the question. I don't understand um, it's, the question. it's not part of our budget now, Kerry, because of the event that happened a couple of weeks ago. I think if she's this, asking we, we I have to go for the agenda. Oh, it's under school okay. safety part one. It's on the second page of the agenda. Flip it over and you'll see it. Yeah, I think I got confused because we were provided the report about the proposed FY24 budget and performance measures, and I just wasn't sure if that was connected to that. So. Okay. Okay, you all set now? Yes, have we passed that already? Yeah, yeah, we're moving on now 
We're moving on to the next item on the agenda. That's what she's asking. Uh, okay. Okay. Paper four. All right. Can I? Can, yes. Go ahead. Because we just got done talking about budget, can I just give a quick shout out and make sure you folks are all updated? Because I should have put something in your packet tonight. Last night, the, the city manager and her finance director presented to the uh, to the city council an overview and initial public hearing on the proposed FY24 budget. Next Monday, 9 to 5 in the Levinson Room at the library, City Council will host a day-long budget mm -hmm. session. It's public. Uh, it, um, it will be recorded. I don't think it will be live, but I think it will be recorded. You're certainly all welcome to join. School right department right now is earmarked to, to present at 1 o'clock. Um, on May 15th? On May 15th, during the day. City Council has another, they have a, a, a City Council meeting Monday night as well, but, but this budget piece is between 9 and 3. On Thursday of next week, the 18th, there are three, uh, what are they calling them? Three um, community uh, budget hearing or listening session. It's not a budget hearing. I, I shouldn't use that word. They're called, um, oh, good heavens. Sorry, I'm trying to find it. Um, Public dialogue sessions. Uh, right now, on the website, the city's website, it, it puts the first, it puts one at the middle school, in the Stokel Commons at 5:30 for an hour. It puts one uh, at community campus upstairs in the movie room at six, and it puts one at the senior center that evening at seven. So, middle school, community campus, and senior center at 5:36 and seven on Thursday, the 18th. Those are public dialogue sessions. There will be not a quorum, but representatives of, of uh, city staff and uh, city council. And then on Monday, Monday the 22nd, council will meet again uh, for a budget hearing, a continued <coughs> public hearing on the budget for public comment. Council will be asking questions. Staff from the different departments will be here to try to respond. So just to give you a sense of of opportunities that you might pay attention to where the council will be considering the budget presentation before them. You certainly are, are welcome to be there as citizens as well as as board members. And um, and after the 22nd, I'm not clear, but I know that I think the target is uh, on the first Monday meeting of June the 5th that hopefully they'd be able to adopt what other hearings might happen after the 22nd. I'm not sure. but Can you send us those dates? Yeah, I could send you all that as well. I mean, it's on the city's website. I'll pull it down, double check it with the city finance and then Push it out to you. Okay. Yep. City newsletter you. has that. And, and it's in the newsletter? Okay, that's yeah. great. Thank you so much. Sorry to slow you down. I just thought no, it was that's okay. important to make sure you all knew that, that is. all that stuff's happening. Thank you, Nathan. Okay, let's move on to correspondence. So, um, just the, the in, term, in terms of, um, we have some letters of resignation the board does not need to vote on. It's more for your, um, just for your awareness. I will mention, you know, anytime we, people move on, we want to thank them for the, their service to the to the district uh, generally. Um, I will specifically point out that uh, Jeanette Souther, our um, Director of People Services, uh, is taking a position at the Monarch School uh, as their new uh, director. Great opportunity for her. We're excited for her. Uh, but we'll, but it's a big position for us. And so it's been posted uh, since the Saturday of April vacation. Um, we're continuing to collect applicants and are working towards um, filling that role. Um, so I just want to make a special point of that due to the importance to our, to our, uh, to our role. Thank That's you. Okay. Um, now we're moving on to um, <clears throat> consideration and approval of policies and I turn it over to Margo. Great. Um, so first on the docket is JBAB for the second read. This is the same policy we looked at on our April 11th. The only change is in line 114 where we had forgotten to replace the old language of transgender with gender identity and expression. Um, so at this point, I will take a motion to approve the second so reading of JBAB. So moved. Thank you. Do I have a second? Second. I would like to make an amendment to the motion. I would like to take out section H. And if I have a, a second, I will talk about it. Second. Um, do you want to talk about the rest of the motion first, or do you want me to address this portion of it? So it seems like you have 
We have a point. motion you to You got a motion on the floor. Oh, and then an you amendment. Have a motion so to, should, you have a motion to amend. So we should address the I amendment. I think you should, have, okay. you should address we the to, amendment. We have to discuss okay. the amendment. I, I have thought very, very hard and long and done research on this particular part of the motion. Um, I talked to Jeff Collins from the NHIAA for a long time. He's an old friend. He was our principal at our high school for a while. Um, I talked to a lawyer from the New Hampshire School Boards Association. Both of those organizations at the present time do not have a policy about this because they're waiting for litigation to be resolved. Apparently there are three lawsuits. One's in Connecticut. That's the closest one to us. And um, it's actually in the federal court right now. So both of those organizations are not going to make decisions until those um, cases are resolved. So right now their policy is it's up to the local school board to set their own policy. So for me, I, when I look at this, it's a question of fairness. I mean, I graduated from high school in 1969 and we did not have girl sports. They didn't exist. In 1972, President Nixon signed the Title IX law, which said that girls and boys have to have an equal amount of opportunities in their high schools, and I guess it was um, colleges that were state-run colleges. So at that point, it was a huge victory for girls in, in schools, because finally, girls had competitive teams in their schools. To me, if, this, if, it, if a stipulation like this is in a policy, it waters down that, that law that was such a huge, and I mean, I remember it because I was at that age, many of you probably weren't born yet, but you know, I distinctly remember it because it was such a huge um, forward step in promoting women in their sports and to me now to allow transgender to play on a girl's team is watering down that policy or that law that we worked so hard to achieve so many years ago. Um, I know it's controversial. Um, I think it's a question of fairness. I think it's just not fair um, to have a transgender play on another team like that. To me, it's a question of fairness. Um, it's not apples to apples. Um, and it, it hurts the competitiveness of that team. So I, I think the policy is great. I think this whole policy is right on. And I know that so many of you worked so hard on this. And I would vote for it if we could take H out. I don't know if we can wait until we get guidance from the NHIAA and the New Hampshire School Boards Association. I don't know if it can be a separate policy so that we can discuss it separately. I don't know, but um, I guess if others want to speak, please do. If not, we'll vote on taking H out. If we don't take it out, then we'll vote for the entire policy as it is, so. I, I can just give you the background <clears throat> since this came up at the last discussion, you had raised the concern. I did speak with Cause um, about the concern, and he had actually just had a meeting with all of the New Hampshire ADs who had reviewed the policy. He is very comfortable with the language that we have in our policy now. It is compliant with NHIA. And, um, and the one thing that's in there in terms of getting at fairness that the ADs discussed and felt that, I can't speak for the ADs because I was not at that meeting, but I think it gets at that concern is that this request is made for the entirety of that athlete's term at school. So you can't choose your sport um, that you would, you know, you would choose to play on an opposing gender and then switch for another season. When you make that proposal or that request to your school district, mm -hmm. you're making that request for your athletic career. And cause felt mm -hmm. as though that made sense. Um, we do have, he did mention that we do have um, several sports at our high school that are not at the most competitive level, that are co-ed. Um, mm -hmm. But I think the concern that you're raising is at the, at the highest level. Um, so that's just the background of doing my mm -hmm. due diligence with cause. Thank you. I yeah. know I've talked to cause about it too. So yeah. uh, Danielle and Liz. 
If I can just take an opportunity, hopefully for some of us to just right chip a little bit or learn. Um, I think the use of a transgender takes away the person first. And so I think we need to really be cautious of the words that we use in these conversations. Um, I also think that fairness is a really difficult conversation to have in regards to children who their world is not fair. It is not fair the way they're treated. It is not fair the way that the world is bigoted towards them already. And so I, I, I hear what you're saying, um, but I think we also just said a transgender on a girl's team and already we're, we're supposing and underlying language around this that is really harmful. Um, and so I, I, think we, I think we need to be mindful of the fact that um, we, we are here to educate every single student. We're here to provide opportunities for every single student. And if that student who is going through a really challenging time has chosen something that is right for them, I think it is really important that we create policies that support a loving, so caring, safe environment for that student. And if that comes with a perceived slight to anybody else on that team, I think maybe we need to check their slate um, because my guess is that our kids are far more welcoming and supportive of each other than sometimes our community can be. I just wanted to add that. Thank you. Liz. Um, I think that my confusion, and I, I appreciate Zach pulling together this um, memo within the policy regarding the NHIA rules. I think my confusion comes in, um, and so there needs to be an edit in each if it's maintained <coughs> in the policy that it's Article 2, Section 5, not Article 3, Section 5, um, that discusses the NHIA participation policy, um, which may actually not go into detail about um, gender identity uh, within sports, but more so recruitment practices and practices um, for sports. Um, I, you know, I appreciate the sentiment as far as, you know, obviously using the correct language and person first language. Um, you know, I do appreciate where Nancy's coming from as far as Title IX and, and, and the concern for women's sports. And obviously, this ongoing litigation issue um, is a bit concerning because um, you know, there hasn't been a ruling one way or the other. I will sort of reaffirm the idea that, um, you know, women in Africa um, in a certain area aren't allowed to run in the Olympics due to high levels of testosterone. Um, and so just because someone's um, uh, may be born female um, or female at birth, um, they may also have high levels of testosterone. Um, you know, you see some of these WNBA players, you know, I, so I guess it's, you know, I, it's, um, um, I think everybody comes in, in all shapes and sizes and walks of life and, I, and, and so, I think this is a really hard issue and obviously a hard issue given the fact that there's litigation around it and it's really at, at this point it seems to be like undis you know up in the air undecided but I do think that we should maintain the policy as it is um, in section H because I do think um, that it provides an open space for students it provides language it's very um, I think that our policy is very specific and short and sweet, and I just would ask that the Article 3 be changed to Article 2 um, and, and sort of uh, and leave it at that, um, that, that students um, be permitted to participate in interclassic activities in a manner consistent with their gender identity. Um, so if there ever became an issue, we have a policy surrounding it, and we, and we all follow the policy. Anyone else have a comment? Pip. I do, yeah. Um, um, I couldn't agree with you more, Nancy, about uh, Title IX. I think it indeed transformed many things for women, um, and particularly sports. Um, I think that to echo what I've heard a little bit, um, uh, I would say that I think, I think in the spirit of this um, policy is inclusion. And um, and so I think because we are no longer in a world where we're talking about men and women only, um, we have we owe it to our students to make space for 
the kids who don't fall into one of those categories as cleanly as we might want them to um, based on the way that our sports are set up. So uh, I, I don't expect that we're going to end up with large numbers of kids trying to participate on a team that differs um, from the, the sex that they were assigned at birth. Um, and so I, I don't think that it is going to present a problem in terms of fairness or um, com competitiveness. Um, I think instead it's going to allow everybody to find a place to participate, which is what we hope for. Lisa, thank you, Pip. Yeah, and Nancy, I really want to echo, I mean, I think Title IX, we can't really underestimate or underemphasize the impact of that for women in sports. I know I benefited from it. I know that, honestly, we have a long way to go, <laughs> even to make that a reality still. Um, but I do think if we're talking about equity and fairness, we really do need to make space for all of our athletes. And the reality right now is that's not the case. Um, and that's not really our fault. I mean, we have teams that are set up to be for boys or for girls, and we have an increasing number of students who don't identify that way. And they are who they are, you know? And trans women are women. And we may or may not, you know, agree with where their place should be on our teams, but I do think that we need to make sure that as a district, we're making them feel welcome and making all of our kids feel welcome, you know? And we still have tryouts and we still have you know, opportunities for the best athletes to get, you know, the spots on the teams and to be the starting lineup on our teams. And I think it also kind of under underestimates our athletes to suggest that, you know, the tryouts aren't competitive just because a trans woman tries out. I mean, the best kids will still get on the team. And there's no guarantee, even if we do have a student who is out and is ready to play on the team as a trans athlete, which takes a ton of bravery and courage, let's face it, because they're going to be out there for the whole community, we should support that. You know, and I, I don't know, I mean, I understand completely where you're coming from with Title IX, but I just think that we also need to make space for the fact that times change. Thank you, Lisa. Anyone else before we vote? I, Carrie? I wanted to jump in. Carrie? Yeah, I just wanted to echo, um, Danielle's comments and others that it's, um, it's, I don't see this as an issue and it's really, really important to me that we um, maybe all work on um, destigmatizing language and making sure that that's part of it. Um, and so I just, I, I don't support removing that. I think it's a really critical thing. And to me, the component that Margot said that this is in compliance with NHIAA for us to um, for us to remove something that is compliant with our kind of sports governing body, I think we are perpetuating stigma, and so um, I will not. I would not support removal of that section. Thank you, Kerry. Anyone else for a comment? Okay. Shall we vote on the amendment? By roll call. I, yep. Roll do call we need vote. roll call? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because yep. on Zoom. And it's second reading. Oh. So again, this is this is uh, so right now we're not voting on the entire policy. No. This, is, this um, is a vote on the amendment of, of H, of H section from yep. and if the vote was to go through, then we would return the discussion of the full policy. Um, and if the vote was to go uh, down, we still would return to the full <laughs> discussion of the full policy with or without H. Correct. So, um, so go ahead, Dr. So a vote of yes means we want to. Yes go. would be to remove. H. Yes is to remove. It is yes. not a vote no, on the entire be. policy. Is exclusively this is exclusively on the amendment. The amendment on the floor, which would be to remove H from the proposed policy. So that would be a yes to remove it. Yes Correct. is a remove. Yes. yes. Yeah. Can I Liz ask Barrett. one clarifying oh. question? Sorry. Yep. Sure. Sorry. Um, I I have two daughters, and I also have a son with Down syndrome, so I totally get all of the um, inclusion. Um, oh, when I think about the issue, I also uh -huh. I do feel for girls who are in changing rooms with people who um, are like we're saying there's no such thing as men and, and women but yet sports are men and women and so there's no way I can get around that for my girls if they're changing in the changing room so I just wonder like what are the thoughts about that 
Like how, how does that stay safe? Because that's just from everything I've thought about. Um, I want every student to feel supported and I want them to feel um, secure and safe. Um, and I also think that is for all students. So I just, I, I would love for someone to explain to me how that's gonna work at Portsmouth High School. There is a section in the policy section F about locker room accessibility, mm -hmm. um, which goes into detail about um, access and need for privacy and advocating for the space that a child would need for the locker room. It's pretty, it, it is consistent with the practices that we're using now and it's been successful. Oh, great. Um, okay. That's, that was my only thought. And, and, it, and it hasn't changed um, since the policy was written in 2016. Right. So we just, just, just the language changed. Change. Yeah. 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 Good question. <clears throat> Okay, so Can we I move think forward. Okay, voting to remove section H. Liz Barrett. No. Pip Clues. No. Lisa Rappaport. No. Ann Walker. Yes. Margot Peabody. No. Nancy Clayberg. Yes. Hope Van Epps. Brian French. No. Carrie Nolte. No. Motion fails. So now we vote on the original motion, the original policy as it's written. Except okay. I believe if I heard oh. um, Liz properly, and I'm, I have in this time looked at the NHIAA, so could we just say that you would just like to amend and make sure that section H includes the proper article and section? Yeah, I believe, it's, I believe it's article two, section five. I'm but looking yes, at the that, proper, the yeah. proper site. Yeah, because I'm looking at article section five right now and it's not in that, so I don't, but we will, let's just say it will list the well, proper Well, no, so article, article section. two, section five talks about recruiting and practices and whatnot. But I don't think there's anything in NHIA regarding gender and uh, whatnot. And so there is. the there reason is. why yeah. this came directly from the language in our policy is pulled directly from NHIA. Okay. Which is what Because I thought maybe they were just citing that they were trying to cite the section for recruitment and whatnot. Mm -hmm. uh, Okay. No, I think it is. I think it's correct. Article three, we checked it, but I will double check that we no, have. No, Article correct. three, section five that I just pulled up was tobacco use. So okay, so correct. Okay, so something. So I don't know. Yeah. Let's just say we'll, we'll modify the. I think the we could consider it a typo in, in this case because yeah. we know we know right. there is one, but we right. may yep. have gotten the name, the number wrong. Yep. Yeah. What line is that? Just so I can. One twenty three and four. One twenty three. So just so we know, the motion on the floor is to approve JBAB as is with the adjustment to lines 123 and 124 to properly list the article and section of the NHIA policy. Was that, I mean, I'm sorry, is there anything glaring that from Zach's um, uh, memo here as far as anything that should be edited based on the information that you pulled together there? No, I think the um, the um, Kath, um, so uh, Kathleen Dwyer sits with us on, as part of the policy committee, mm -hmm. and I think there was a the when we had read the last time we had done the initial reading of JBAB, the the discussion was to push this back to policy, but it wasn't necessarily was specific. It was there were some I think and the attempt was to take what people were discussing and try to, as a committee, respond to some of the things that were discussed as it was pushed back to policy, not with a specific task per se, except to kind of review based on what people had said in the meeting. So the memo is an attempt to have the committee effectively respond to the things that some people had indicated they had concerns or needed clarity on. So do we need to make amend an amendment to allow for like, like it says suggested changes discussed. You said in line 62, when creating a student support plan, the student will be informed that the educational record to which the, their parents can have access. Did that, I don't know that that was updated on line 62. No, because there was no motion for it. If you'd like to make a motion to make that change, we can do that at add second that reading. Policy. We can add that. Okay, so um, I'd like to make a motion to um, um, add the suggested edits from Superintendent McLaughlin's um, policy memo. That's 
it's not specific. Yeah, you need to be clear. You need to say what you want to change. Any, well, it says, and so it's in the last paragraph. It's the last paragraph. Any language can be made in motion second reading. There was discussed about the following. Lines 52 to 30, <laughs> 52 to 32. I don't know what that is. Uh, there was a suggestion that the word intentional be inserted before the words disclose information. Um, line 114. Remove the word transgender. This was a typographical error. It's already it been changed. So I mean, can we just can I can we just do the proposed changes within that paragraph? Like, do I really need to get in? Can we just copy and paste? That's my motion. No. No, you need to make a specific motion. Like, are you motioning that line at the end of line 62? You need to add language. Or I will say that line 114 has already been altered. That was a typo. Yeah, I don't know what this line 52 to 32. 52 to we what? We had it in our packet for a week. But it was a. It was a. But it's a. It's a typo, and I can't. Um, um, yeah, I, I think I'm guessing 52 to 62 is kind of no, what we're looking at. It's line it? 52 to 53 where it there says it school personnel should not disclose information. And the conversation that we had at the last meeting was should not intentionally disclose information, whether or not that word should be added. But no motion was made, thus it did not go back to policy for changes. If you'd like to make the motion to add the word in line 52, we can take that motion. Okay, I well, I would like to make a motion to add the word knowingly, because um, I think that's a better word than intentional. Knowingly um, disclose information to line 52, 53. Um, and I would like to make a motion to add, or within the same motion, add, uh, after the last sentence. when creating, a, to line 62, when creating a student support plan, the student will be informed that it is an educational record to which their parents can have access. There's not a line 62. Um, so after mean? line 61, so on line 62, yeah. 61 and 62, add that language. Okay. Do you want me to repeat? Yes, please. Yes. Okay. I make a motion to amend lines 52 and 53 to add the word knowingly before disclosing and in, disclose information and on lines 61 and 62 add when creating a student support plan the student will be informed that it is an educational record to which their parents can have access do i have a second can we separate those please my motion's on the table so if there's a second Okay. I mean, I don't know what the point of. I mean, we can just get this over with. I don't know. I would have a different opinion. If you, about well, if you both second, of those if you ideas, second, you can have a you? discussion about it. Somebody okay. second. Is there a second? If there is no second, the motion dies. Do we want to go back to the original motion of passing this policy as it is? I'd like to. Well, I guess I'd like to make a motion to amend to have to add on sixty line, line sixty one and sixty two that when creating a student support plan, the student will be informed that it is an educational record to which their parents can have access. Do I have a second? Second. Do we have discussion? I'll discuss. I think it's important that the students are well aware of what their rights are. You know, per Zach's memo. Um, that that language should be in there. Any other discussion? Okay, let's vote on that amendment. I guess it has to be roll call, correct? Yep. yep. Liz Barrett? Yes. Pip Clues? Yes. Lisa Rappaport? Yes. Ann Walker? No. Margot Peabody? Yes. Nancy Clayberg? No. Hope Van Epps? Brian French? Yes. Carrie Nolte? Harry? Yes. Yes. Motion passes. <clears throat> okay, can we go back to the. And now it's to approve JBAB. As amended. As amended. As amended. Two amendments. No, there's one. one, 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 one no, no, it was the NHIA. Oh, 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 oh okay. Right, right, right. right, right. 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 Just make sure we're all on My board here. <laughs> so <Yep>. sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Margo. <laughs> I think okay. we're ready. Is there any discussion further? All right, Dr. Haynes, we're ready. 
Okay. Liz Barrett. Yes. Pip Clues. Yes. Lisa Rappaport. Yes. Ann Walker. Yes. Margot Peabody. Yes. Nancy Clayberg. No. Hope Van Epps. Brian French. Yes. Carrie Nolte. Yes. Motion passes. Thank you, everyone. Um, next one. The next one is, oh, I already lost my, um, J-I-C-H. This is coming back. We had it. Um, it went through first read, and there, if you recall, um, there was a large discussion around line three where m many of many members brought up the concern that over-the-counter drugs are being held at the same level of discipline as um, <clears throat> drugs and alcohol. And so that, that went back to the policy. It was discussed at great length. And you will see that line three over-the-counter has been removed. And then lines five, six have been added because over-the-counter drugs are addressed in our policy JICD. And so anything related to over-the-counter drugs would follow what's outlined in JICD. Um, so that's the only changes since we saw it last time. It got bogged up in the system a little bit, so I apologize if it's been a little bit since you remember. But if anybody has any other questions about can't recall why we sent it back, um, I can answer that. But this is for a single reading to approve it. Do we have a oh well, do we have a motion first of all? Let's get it on the floor. All right, good idea. Motion Le to approve. Hip second. Second. Brian. Discussion. Lisa. I just had a question, um, and I feel like we talked about this, but I just don't remember where we landed. Mm -hmm. How are we defining unauthorized prescription drugs for the purpose of this policy? Do you remember where we landed on that? Unauthorized prescription drugs, for example, would be something that is prescribed to you that I have. So it's not authorized. So, you know, that, would, and that would be the administrative interpretation would be there are drugs. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you have to have a prescription to have the drugs that are not available in front of the counter. Right. And okay. You don't yeah. have a prescription and you are utilizing that okay. set yeah. of drugs. Then thank you. Yeah. That would Sorry. Be the thing. I, you I said it right remember. there. Thank you. Okay. Any other discussion points on JICH? Great. Then I would say we're ready for a roll call vote. Liz Barrett. Yes. Pip Clues. Yes. Lisa Rappaport. Yes. Ann Walker. Yes. Margot Peabody. Yes. Nancy Clayberg. Yes. Hope Van Epps. Brian French. Yes. Carrie Nolte. Yes. Motion passes. Thank you. And then finally, um, this is also up for a single read. We actually did, this is policy JLCD, which we just recently passed in second reading in December, and then as the policy was being implemented, um, it was noted by the nurses that um, something had been left out that actually hadn't originally been in our policy. It had been in a model policy that had been under consideration when it went through the nurses and the policy committee and was just a small oversight. And so the li lines that have been added are lines 14 through 16, which was pulled from the New Hampshire State School Board Association model policy, JLCD-R. And that just states that with the exception of self-administered medications listed below, all non-prescription over-the-counter medications must be delivered to the school nurse in their original container or packaging. So this um, gets rid of the concern of students bringing two Advil in a baggie um, or anything of that note. So they have, the, the medication has to come in its original packaging. And that, that was an oversight, no, no blame there, but needs to go into the policy. So this is, we passed it, so this is just a single read, which would just pass it through again with this modification. Move to approve. Second. Great. Any discussion? Great. I think we're ready for roll call. Liz Barrett? Yes. Pip Clues? Yes. Lisa Rappaport? Yes. Ann Walker? Yes. Margot Peabody? Yes. Nancy Clayberg? Yes. Hope Van Epps? Brian French? Yes. Carrie Nolte? Yes. Motion passes. Great. Thank you, everyone. Thank you to Margo and the other members of the policy committee. I know you people work long and hard on these policies, and you all deserve a, a big round of applause. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. uh, well, uh, one thing, since we're on policy, the, with the policy committee's next 
major task will be looking at academic integrity. And I know we're all familiar with the challenges that we're facing in our school. So if there are specific questions that you have or concerns, I would advise you to please direct those to the policy committee to make sure your concerns are raised in the discussion, which will be in the first week of June. Okay, thank you. Okay, we are moving on to consideration and approval of employment. So you have uh, five positions. Uh, four of those five positions are folks that have inhabited other roles for us. Um, um, some of those temporary were in one-year roles filling leaves. Uh, as people have moved, um, have let us know that they're not returning and through previous uh, letters to the board, uh, these folks would be f uh, filling those positions. The last position, uh, number five, is a special ed coordinator position uh, at the high school um, that is a replacement for a uh, longtime uh, special educator, Lori, Mel Lori Melanson, who's retiring at the end of this year. We don't need a motion for this, do we? To, uh, to approve employment, you oh, do. Yes. Mm -hmm. So the, the okay. resignations you do not, but right. to approve employment, okay. you do. Okay, do we have a motion to approve these five employees? Motion to approve. Second? Second. Okay. All in favor? Uh, no. no we Roll call. Oh, we have oh, oh, because of Kerry. Okay. Liz Barrett. Yes. Pip Clues. Yes. Lisa Rappaport. Yes. Ann Walker. Yes. Margot Peabody. Yes. Nancy Clayberg. Yes. Hope Van Epps. Brian French. Yes. Gary Nolte. Kerry? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Motion passes. <laughs> okay. Next, we have consideration and approval of school custodial agreement. We had um, a meeting with our att attorney, Tom Claussen, earlier. Do I have a motion to accept the uh, contract? Motion to accept the contract. Second. Thank you, Liz. Thank you, Ann. Any discussion? Okay. Can we have a roll call vote, please? Liz Barrett. Yes. Pip Clues. Yes. Lisa Rappaport. Yes. Ann Walker. Yes. Margot Peabody. Yes. Nancy Clayberg. Yes. Hope Van Epps. Brian French. Yes. Gary Nolte. Yes. Motion passes. Okay. We're getting faster as we go. I know. Wow. <laughs> each time. Okay. The, la the next item on the agenda, consideration and approval to submit written testimony in support of HB 572. And I will hand it over to Lisa. Thanks, Nancy. Um, so I just want to say before this motion, the Legislative Committee meeting minutes are lower down in the packet under committee updates, but that does include the background information on the discussion. The board previously voted to support this legislation, and so this is potential proposed written testimony that we would then go ahead and submit if the board passes this motion. And in the committee, we drafted what we hope is a short and relatively straightforward position of support, which is in the packet. So I would make a motion to support HB 572. I can read what's written in the packet so it's on the record if you would like. Um, the motion is to submit the following statement. The Portsmouth School Board supports legislative efforts to expand student access to free and reduced cost meals because students who are hungry cannot learn. The Portsmouth School Board recognizes that many families who don't qualify for public assistance may still struggle with food insecurity. The Portsmouth School Board supports HB 572, which expands eligibility for free meals for New Hampshire students, so long as the funding comes from the state and not from local school districts. So that's the motion. That's as written in the packet. Um, we did discuss this when we discussed our position, but <clears throat> I need a second. 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 And then, oh, okay. you got your second. Yep. Do we have any discussion? I guess I have a question. Um, the only thing that I was sort of identifying is that we're saying that, I mean, obviously we, we support expanded access to free and reduced cost meals, but I think this legislation is to support free meals, right? So. Um, so instead of saying reduce costs, I mean, aren't we supporting free meals, like free meals um, generally? So I guess I just wonder if the language regarding reduced costs should be removed. Um, if you would like to make that motion, you can. Well, I guess um, my question, though, is like, why was the, I mean, I, uh, this is, this legislation, though, is to expand free meals, right? Yeah. Like, 
Okay, I do understand your question. So our legislative principles that we adopted as a board at the beginning of the session were broadly in support of both free and reduced cost meals. And so that was why it was worded that way. Okay. If you'd like to make a motion to change it, we can certainly. No, so my question, though, is that the legislation, <coughs> House Bill 572, is, is, is what exactly? It's expanding eligibility for free meals for New Hampshire students? That or is, is it also yes. reduced free and reduced meals? No, it expands free meals to 300% of the poverty level from 200%. Um, I believe Margot kindly reminded me what the exact dollar amount of that is for a family of four, but I don't have that in front <laughs> Can't of me remember again. Right now. Yep. Um, but basically, you're correct. It would expand free meals, not reduced cost meals. So if you'd like to take out reduced, we certainly can. No, I think it that's was written that way just because that was our broad legislative principle that the board had um, at the beginning of the session that guided our position yeah I, so I, I don't um, I think we should leave it in I think my only discrepancy would be to change the word don't to do not just because it's um, that's my uh, editorial legal perspective of something <laughs> this just to make it more formal so I would just say uh, but I think that's more of a typo situation if we you want to call it a typo it. situation so you want to change don't to do not yeah that's all okay so I'm, I'm not I'm not trying to make a motion <laughs> okay shall we any more discussion okay roll call Dr. Haynes, please. Liz Barrett. Yes. Pip Clues. Yes. Lisa Rappaport. Yes. Ann Walker. Yes. Margot Peabody. Yes. Nancy Clayberg. Yes. Hope Van Epps. Brian French. Yes. Terry Nolte. Yes. Motion passes. Motion passes. It's your supermajority. Um, I lost the second page of my agenda. Oh, is, that, no is there anything else on the committee oh, updates? Oh, committee, committee updates. updates. Okay. Do we have any committee updates? I just gave the one from policy, please. We are. Take, and I would I would say if you um, how do I want to say this the current academic integrity policy as it sits is is very outdated so the model policy with the Hampshire School Board Association is the one that we're starting our conversation based off of and I if you don't have access to that I can share it with you but again please if you have questions or concerns or or things that you wish to be considered. Um, direct that to the policy committee. Okay, thank you. Anyone else have a committee update? Lisa? Legislative right committee there. update. Yes. <laughs> so you have out of order. Order. <laughs> um, I would just ask everybody to please, if you do have time, to take a close look at the minutes from the May 1st meeting. As you know, this is an ad hoc committee, and we're going to have to make a decision at some point as a board about whether we want to continue the committee. And if we do want to continue it, you know, what's the best structure, who should be on it, and all of those things are decisions that the board is going to need to make. We started some conversations around what we felt in the committee worked well and not as well this year. And as may be a surprise to nobody, the strength we found was that we moved slowly and deliberately. We tried very hard to keep in mind um, what issues the board had broad consensus around so that we were bringing things forward only when we thought that we had broad support in this room and we didn't want to go into directions that weren't where many, most of the board members wanted to go. And as will also not surprise you, we got a single bill through our process this year. So. Um, you know, there were many things that worked well, but I would say from the perspective of impact, we could probably agree that having many committee meetings to take a position on a single bill is probably not the best use of Zach's time, our teacher's time, my time, and, you know, not where we really want to have an impact. So we're thinking hard about what the best way would be to bring this committee um, into a different direction if we want to continue it. I think folks on the committee felt like some version of the committee could be continued and could still have a positive advocacy um, effect for our district um, and be a good voice for our board, but that the way that we go about that might need to shift and who's in the room might need to shift a little bit. I don't want to bore you all by reading all of the minutes uh, line by line, but there's a lot of questions that we're grappling with, and I really tried to take the extra time in the minutes for that particular meeting to really lay out very carefully what were the main points that everybody raised that we should think about. So I would really encourage people to reach out to me if you have other things you think we should consider or if you look at the minutes and there's certain things that jump out as you to you as a good idea or a bad idea or you have other thoughts from your perspective on how the process went this year 
it would be really good to know that in the next week or so. Our next meeting is May 22nd, and we're going to hopefully at that meeting try to come up with some consensus in the committee about what we think it should look like next year. And then it will come back to the board for a discussion and a vote on what the next steps should be. So I'm not going to read it all, but I'd say I really would love it if you all do and weigh in so that if we do go forward, we can do it in a way that is the most productive. Can I just ask you a quick question? Yes. Where did that cursive writing and multiplication table, where did that come from? What do you that mean? Bill, that <laughs> bill that just passed two days ago that yes. every student has to know cursive. the multiplication. Um, was that was, a tag on to some other bill? Believe it or not, no. That was a bill that has been out there the entire time. Really? Um, and oh God. I think that's something, Nancy, where it's interesting that you bring that up because I know I heard from a few teachers who had some questions about that particular piece of legislation. <laughs> um, yeah. And, oh, you know, as a board, that wasn't a topic that we really had identified as one that we wanted to weigh in on as a wow. policy because <laughs> who would have thought that would be a thing? Yeah. But that's kind of a question if, if that's something where we did want to perhaps make our thoughts known early in the session for something like that. Yeah. 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 Uh, but now uh, we have that. Right. that we are going to learn cursive and memorize our multiplication tables <laughs> in a very fast, it's timed. Right. And which is not quite how we teach yeah, math I, right now. <laughs> and I would say broadly, I think, you know, it's a, it's a good conversation for the future. I mean, this yeah. is, I would, separate from this one individual thing, <laughs> if this opens the door to the legislature is going to assign pedagogy, yeah. like yeah. here's the lesson you're going to teach, yeah. here's the yeah. way in which you're going to teach it, and here's... The, the loosey-goosey loosey reasons why we're oh. making these types of decisions that we're going to mandate across uh, districts. So like as I was, I was saying to people, today we're about to run uh, two, um, Matt, we're running math pilots in the, in the fall to look at two new, um, two new um, programs that might become our new math program. Uh, neither one of those are going to put a heavy emphasis on memorization of multiplication tables. <laughs> Um, so, um, you so. probably won't find any. <laughs> probably not. Uh, flashcards. Sure. You can use so. flashcards. Oh, boy. So there's. <laughs> But there are a lot of things like that, Nancy. Yeah, I mean, there was one on like instruction and communism. There was one on, you know, I mean, there's one last year that was on financial literacy that did pass. Yeah. And that was in a sort of different, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, that just line. Be good. Yeah. Right. Well, there's lots of them every session. That wasn't an area we didn't talk at all about weighing in on the curriculum bills if we have lack of a better description that just wasn't on our list right but we knew about it right right well thank you thank you for keeping on top of all of that are there any other committee reports i think we're all set do we have a motion to adjourn motion to adjourn second, second. all in favor aye, aye. aye.